Good morning, good afternoon, and, and or good evening, uh, wherever you're calling in from. My name is Melvin Foote, and I am the founder and president of the Constituency for Africa. The Constituency for Africa, the 30-year-old not-for-profit education and policy advocacy organization based here in Washington, D.C. in the United States. Our mission is to educate the public about Africa, promote cooperation and coordination among the various organizations which focus on Africa, and to impact and help shape U.S. policies toward Africa. Our target audience is the African diaspora, African Americans, African immigrants, Afro-Caribbean, Afro-Latinos, Africans in Europe, and other Africans around the world. We certainly lay no claim to being the leader of the diaspora because really no one organization can lead the diaspora. We can only foster cooperation and coordination. Moreover, CFAs tries to make sure that all in the diaspora have access to solid information, which we believe will assist all in the taking proactive steps, which will benefit our sisters and brothers on the continent, as well as across the diaspora. The coronavirus pandemic has now impacted the entire world. Originating in China sometime late last year, the coronavirus has now infected more than 3 million people worldwide. The actual numbers are probably much greater than this because of the limited testing, with over 250,000 so far documented deaths. All of the models indicate that we are clearly nowhere near the peak of the pandemic. And we all know much of the impact thus far has been felt in Asia, in Europe, and certainly here in the United States. Uh, here in the U.S., we heard this morning that the infection rate in the U.S., as we start to reopen our economy, is about to explode up to 200,000 new cases per day by June 1st, accompanied by 3,000 deaths per day. What about Africa? How is the coronavirus impacting Africa and African countries? We, we, we hear all kinds of things. We hear that the numbers are low in Africa and that COVID-19 does not affect black people the way it affects white people. We hear that the hot and humid climate of Africa is not suitable for the virus. What is the real situation in Africa and the projections going forward? What are the African governments actually doing to mitigate the impact of COVID-19? Also, and most importantly, on the call today, how can we in the diaspora most effectively assist Africa? These are some of the key questions that we will address in this video call today. We are certainly very pleased to have as our principal briefer for the call, the director of the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Addis Ababa, Dr. John N. Nkingasa, who, who, who you will be hearing from shortly. We are also honored to have as a speaker, Congresswoman Karen Bass, who is the chair of the Congressional Black Caucus and the chair of the House of Representatives Subcommittee on Global Health. I will certainly uh, want to thank our partners in organizing this video forum, most notably the Africa Center for Disease Control, Harvard University, and the Center for African Studies and the African Student Health Forum, the Information Communication Technology University, the Foreign Investment Network, the Drew Technological Tech Theological School, and Dr. Jabril Diallo and the African Renaissance and Diaspora Network, MEPAD, Most influ Influential People of African Cent Descent, and, and, and my good friends at allafrica.com. Let me now call on my boss, the chair of the Constituency for Africa, Janine Scott, for her remarks. Janine. Uh, well, good morning, afternoon, or evening to all, depending on where you're connecting uh, with us from. And uh, welcome and thank you for joining in this very important, I would dare say, an urgent conversation today. My name is Janine Scott, and I'm the chairman of the Constituency for Africa. And as Mel has said, we're a 32-year-old organization that has established itself as a leader in mobilizing and educating stakeholders throughout the US and the diaspora on matters of importance to Africa. Illustri illustratively over the years, CFA has been a key driver in the development of coherent US Africa policies, such as the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, which is known as PEPFAR, 
and the Young African Leaders Initiative, YALI. And its African Healthcare Infrastructure Committee has responded to epidemics such as Ebola and other healthcare insufficiencies on the African continent over the years. In line with our mission, we have put together this web conference with our organizing partners from Harvard University and the Africa Centers for, Centers for Disease Control to highlight how the COVID-19 pandemic is affecting the continent, but moreover to examine how we in the African diaspora may be able to mobilize our support and our resources to fight this scourge. Indeed, it is already poignantly clear that we need to increase the number of healthcare uh, professionals and human resources dedicated to health services and to invest more in healthcare infrastructure. This applies globally and especially in Africa at both the continental level and especially at the country level. Such investments would promote multiple health, economic, and social benefits. We must ourselves propose viable and sustainable solutions with regard to how the diaspora with other partners will leverage our public and private sectors, ranging from healthcare professionals to medical institutions, health information systems, logistics and drug supplies, to our philanthropic organizations and private investors with the interest and capability to invest writ large in healthcare in Africa. And I think sometimes we overlook how much the private sector may be able to do. I'd like to shout out one of the good friends of CFA, Dr. Wilmot Allen, who is an African-American who resides in Kenya. He's working with Dr. John Kenksang uh, on, in designing the Africa strategy, the Africa Public Health Foundation strategy. And he is also a partner in a venture capital firm that is raising $100 million specifically for healthcare infrastructure as an example of what we can do. Our speakers today will help us to frame this discussion and hopefully we'll come away with some actionable items and commitments to move forward. Uh, as Mel has said, we have a number of partners that we'd like to thank who've made today possible for us. So of course, I'd like to thank Mel for his leadership of the constituency, but Dr. Will Ngua, who's the, the director of the Global Health Catalyst Summit at, and a professor at Harvard, uh, our keynote speaker, of course, Dr. John Kenkesung, who's the director of the Africa Centers for Disease Control. Uh, the Honorable Karen Bass, as Mel has said, is the chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, as well as the House Subcommittee on Africa and Global Health. Um, our media partners, All Africa, the Foreign Investment Network, and I'm sure I've left some out, but thank you all. Thank you again, and during these difficult times, may we all stay safe, and I'll turn it back to Mel so we can open the, the full dialogue. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm back at you, right? Okay. Yes. Uh, Congresswoman Bass is trying to call in now. Huh? <laughs> okay, Congresswoman Bass is trying, let's see, video call with John Ingers. Okay, she's on now, right? Congresswoman, are you with us? Right? Is Congresswoman with us? Huh? Uh, one moment, please. Wait a minute. She just sent a message. Will, she just sent a message. Hello. Got it. Got it? Yeah, one moment. Okay. But I don't, I, I uh, okay. Oh, here she is. Okay, we good. Yep. Yeah. Uh, oh. We've been joined by Congresswoman Karen Bass, uh, who uh, is my uh, shero. <laughs> and uh, she's doing an outstanding job leading the Congressional Black Caucus and also the House of Representatives Subcommittee on Global Health, on Africa and Global Health and a bunch of other things. Uh, so Congresswoman, the, uh, the, 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 you're on. <laughs> okay, well, good morning, everyone, from wherever you are. Uh, I would imagine around the whole world, I certainly know uh, around the country. 
I want to thank uh, Mel always for your continued leadership. I can't believe I've been in Congress now 10 years, and every year of those 10 years, we've worked very closely together, so thank you. And then so importantly for pulling this conversation together today. Uh, as all of us are experiencing this incredible new journey uh, that we're on, and, and the thing that is so stressful about our journey is that we just don't know where we're going and, and uh, how long it is going to last. And so I have, as Mel described, been completely immersed in what is going on here in the United States, and especially the most unfortunate statistic that the disproportionate death rate amongst Black Americans is so extremely uh, uh, high. And that has definitely consumed my time. However, I never, ever, ever take my sights off of the continent. Uh, I am very concerned about the potential of the pandemic um, spreading. I know that it has hit many, many countries in Africa, and so far it has not been uh, devastating, but then the question is testing. And frankly, we are struggling here in the United States in ways that we certainly didn't imagine before. So I, am, uh, I think if, if no one understood how small our world was before COVID hit, I think they do now and also about how we are all in this together. And so I am hoping that the lessons that the world is learning can be applied rapidly to the continent. And if ever we could understand the importance of our cooperation around the world. And I would love, frankly, to see the world come together and stamp out COVID in the same way the world did that around uh, Ebola. I want you to know that in Congress, we are working to pass another bill. Uh, I happen to believe that this pandemic is so devastating here on the economy and on the health and in our health status that there will probably be many more bills to come. Um, there is a, a, a lot of confusion here, uh, as I know everybody on this call knows, uh, but I think it's most important that we all stay focused on science and let science guide us. When science doesn't guide you and you let your emotions take you away, then you often look for scapegoats. And I want you to know that in the next bill, we will be calling very strongly for the full restoration of funding for the World Health Organization. And um, one of the things that I will be looking forward to and learning uh, during this call is what more should we be doing? And you know, sometimes when you have a crisis, it's an opportunity to try to get some things accomplished that you weren't able to do in normal times. In the, in the, U the United States, one of the things that the Congressional Black Caucus is looking at is repairing and strengthening our safety net, is looking at our criminal justice system. Because if ever there was a time to downsize the prison system in the United States, it's right now. Because needless to say, that is where the infection has been, has spread rather rapidly. So maybe when it comes to the continent of Africa, maybe it's an opportunity for some of the conflicts to be put on pause. It would be nice to think that it would be a time to look and say why we are, why are we in these conflicts? But at a minimum, maybe it could be put on pause. But maybe it's also a time, just like during Ebola, to look at the health infrastructure on the continent and say what more can we do to help in that, to, to strengthen that. Prior to COVID in my subcommittee, we were working on a variety of issues uh, in Africa. And one of them is how to strengthen the educational system. I don't want to see COVID used anywhere in the United States or around the world as a way to to shrink the democratic space. And I know it is an opportunity for countries where they were thinking about altering their constitution or changing their election. And we have to make sure that that doesn't happen in our country. And we certainly have to make sure that it doesn't happen in countries on the continent. So I just want to thank you so much for the invitation to be here with you today, Mel. I will look forward to learning about the recommendations and figuring out what more we can do in Congress to combat COVID, especially, especially as it expands on the continent of Africa. Thank you very much, Mel. Thank you very much, Congresswoman. And I, uh, I hope you can stay with us for a while and uh, hear at least Dr. Kinga song. 
Uh, with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Will Ingwa from Harvard University, who's my organizing partner, who's going to uh, uh, set up the introduction for uh, Dr. Uh, Nkinga Song. Uh, so, Will, the, uh, it's in your court. Oh, thank you very much, Mayor. Um, I would like to hand over the introduction of our keynote speaker for today uh, to um, my colleague, Professor Emmanuel Akimpong, who is uh, one of the outstanding diaspora leaders um, working with me here at Harvard, Harvard University. So um, I see that Professor Emmanuel is on. Professor Emmanuel, can you introduce? Thank you, Will. Uh, let me start off by thanking Melvin Foote, uh, President of the Constituency for Africa, uh, and my colleague, uh, Will Ingwa, for convening this forum on COVID-19 in Africa and Africans in Diaspora United. Uh, my name is Emmanuel Echampon. I'm a professor of history and of African and African American studies, and I'm the Oppenheimer Faculty Director for the Center for African Studies at Harvard. Uh, the Center for African Studies is excited to be part of today's event uh, as it speaks to the center's interest in not only being a source of accurate information on Africa and COVID-19, but also for setting side by side the African and African-American experiences of COVID-19. In this regard, it is my pleasure to share a few details on the center's COVID-19 and Africa weekly webinar. In collaboration with the Africa CDC, these webinars are intended to provide an accurate depiction of COVID-19 in Africa, as well as connect with Africans and the diaspora on issues affecting them. The webinars will include panelists from across the Harvard community, as well as experts on the field. The first webinar will be on May 13th at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on the topic of African and African Americans with COVID-19. And it will be co-sponsored by the Hutchins Center for African and African American Research at Harvard University. If you would like to know more about this forthcoming series, please go to africa.harvard.edu to learn more about our series and to sign up for the newsletter for the weekly schedule. On March 5th this year, just a week before Harvard University closed its campus to academic gatherings, we had the honor of having Dr. John Inken Gasson give the keynote address for the inaugural Joseph Ejipong Distinguished Lecture on Public Health in Africa, hosted at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. During the visit, the Center for African Studies facilitated meetings for Dr. John Inken Gesson with a number of key faculty in public health and related research, including Dean Michelle Williams of the Chan School of Public Health, Dr. Shish Jha of the Harvard Global Public Health Institute. At the medical school, Dr. Inken Gesson met with Dr. Paul Farmer and Dr. Eugene Richardson. Both were at the forefront of recent Ebola epidemics in West Africa and the Democratic Republic of Congo, and they have pledged to assist the Africa CDC with its current uh, engagement with COVID-19. Let me introduce Dr. John Nkengesson. Uh, Dr. Nkengesson is the director of the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Prior to his current position, he served as the current Deputy Principal Director of the Center for Global Health, United States Center for Disease Control and Prevention, or the US CDC, and served also as Chief of the International Laboratory Branch, Division of Global HIV and TB, US CDC. He received a Master's in Tropical Biomedical Science at the Institute of Tropical Medicine in Antwerp, Belgium, and a doctorate in medical sciences, virology from the University of Brussels in Belgium. He has received numerous awards for his work, including the Shepherd Science Award, 
the William Watson Medal of Excellence, which is the highest recognition awarded by the Centers for Disease Control. He is also recipient of the Knight of Anna Medal by the government of Côte d'Ivoire and was knighted in 2017 as an officer of the Lion by the president of Senegal, His Excellency Makil Sal, and knighted in November 2018 by the government of Cameroon for his significant contributions to public health. He is an adjunct professor at the Emory School of Public Health. He serves on several international advisory boards, including the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Initiative, the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative, among others. He has authored over 250 peer-reviewed articles in international journals and published several book chapters. Join us in welcoming Dr. John Nkengesson, who will discuss the prospects and challenges for Africa in addressing the COVID-19 pandemic and role of the diaspora. Thank you, Dr. John Nkengesson. Thank you, thank you, Emmanuel, for uh, your, your very kind introduction. And um, as my slides are projected, I would like to share the screen with you. Let me uh, also. Um, uh, if if the operator can allow us share the slides, it says host disabled attendance screen sharing. Please let us have them uh, enable us to. Yes, please. So why that is coming on, let me um, really thank Mel Food, uh, Willie Ward, and uh, others for uh, your kind uh, uh, support and in organizing this. This has taken several weeks to, pull, to be pulled together. Um, Congresswoman Karen Bass for uh, meeting you, seeing you again on this uh, forum. And uh, uh, we greatly appreciate your visit at the African Union. Uh, the, the a few months ago. And I would like to also thank uh, Emmanuel for being a very kind host when I visited uh, Harvard in March. And let me, uh, before we go into the core of the presentation, kind of make three statements. First of all is that the COVID-19 uh, represents a multifactorial dimension challenge on the continent of Africa, as I believe it is uh, globally. Uh, it's a, a serious health and humanitarian challenge for the continent. It is a serious economic challenge for our continent, and it is a serious security challenge for the continent. And I will even add very deliberately that it is a serious national security threat for our continent. Secondly, is that this is a war that we must win. We are at war with the COVID-19. It's a war that we must win in order to survive as a continent, given the fragile nature of our continent in terms of health infrastructure, economic uh, capabilities. Me, John, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, you are showing a blank white screen right now. Uh, okay, the, are you? They're working on it, trying to get you share the screen. Yeah, that is. Yeah, that one, then share. How about that? Yes, now we see it. Okay, go ahead and good. go into full screen with your presentation. Just one second. Yes. There you go. We're all Is set. that good? Thank you. Good. And good. So, so I was saying that um, those are three dimensions on which we are operating. And lastly, that my last reflection before I go into the core of the presentation is that uh, we are globally at war with COVID-19. We've not seen this challenge in the last 100 years, since uh, 1918. And this is a challenge that uh, uh, as a war, there will be local battles, which is every country has to fight as hard as possible. But the victory has to be global because COVID-19 anywhere in the world will be a threat everywhere in the world. So with that, I would like to segue to the, what I'm calling the state of the pandemic in Africa. And I'll do, and I'll do three things. First 
of all, I'll, I'll spend the first couple of minutes uh, reviewing for you the situation of COVID-19 on the continent. And then secondly, uh, discuss the response so far as a continental body and also speak to how the continent is coordinating its efforts. And lastly, end up with some uh, reflections on the way forward and opportunities for, for partnership. So as earlier mentioned, I think Mayor touched on this, uh, we are in a global village. So I would always like to start with this slide and uh, to uh, just remind ourselves that we are over 3.5 uh, million cases of COVID globally and over 200,000 uh, people have died from this, unfortunately. I think uh, no one was expecting this at this scale when we started the year, and, but here we are with, with COVID-19. If I segue now into the continent of Africa, as of 4th of May, which is yesterday, at 9 a.m. East African time, there were 44,483 cases of COVID uh, infections reported from 53 of the 55 African states, member states of the African Union. And of these, unfortunately, 1,800 individuals have died from this infection. If you look at a continent by geography, that is, you look at the five regions that constitute the African continent, you see a pattern that speaks to a, a, a certain trend. First of all, the Northern African region uh, is leading this uh, unfortunate pandemic on the continent with about 17,000 cases, followed by the western part of the continent with about 12,000 cases, and then the southern part of the continent with 7,000 cases, and Central and East Africa both have about 4,000 cases there. If you dive deep into the continent and you say, well, how can we rank the, the 50 something countries into countries that are showing a slow increase in cases, countries that are showing a moderate increase in cases, and countries that are actually witnessing a very fast pace in terms of accelerated uh, 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 increases in number of cases there. So the first panel, which is the red panel, gives you, without going into naming those countries, share with you those countries that are really experiencing a, a very rapidly evolving uh, uh, pandemic. They, they range from the Cameroon in Central Africa uh, to uh, Tanzania. Then in the middle are countries that have a moderate increase in, in cases over the last period of weeks. That is from March 20th to the 1st of, of May. And they include the Algeria, the, the Egypt, and Morocco, and South Africa. The reason I highlight these countries is that, uh, as you see in the subsequent slide, this a combination of Morocco, Algeria, South Africa, and Nigeria constitute uh, uh, about 50% of the cases on the continent. But their, their statistics indicate that they are in the moderate uh, uh, categories of countries with respect to new cases. And then the last category of countries are those in green, where they are, they, we really are experiencing a very slow uh, increase in number of cases there. If we now look at the, region, the different regions and the five regions that are indicated and you say what is the rate of increase of this uh, weekly increase in number of cases, new cases by region, you see that the, the Central Africa region has, an, has witnessed an increase of 36% over the last week. Uh, the East African region about 37%. The Northern Africa region with about 38%. The Southern region 48% and Western uh, uh, African region with about 50% of the cases there. So we keep, we continue to track, track these uh, cases by region. The question that people have always have asked is, have we reached, are we flattening our curve? Have we reached the, the, the peak yet? The graph you are seeing in front of you shows you a seven day moving average, which is uh, we are tracking over the last uh, couple of weeks. and. It indicates clearly that we are not, uh, we've not yet at the top of, of, of a curve. So we are not flattening yet as we take us collectively as a continent of 1.2 billion people. Just within the last week, we had a 39% increase in uh, number of cases when you look at the moving average. Then 
you ask yourself the question, which are those countries, as I indicated, <clears throat> that have uh, contributed most of these cases there? They include South Africa with 6,700 cases, followed by Egypt with 6,400 cases, then Morocco, about 5,000, Algeria, 4,000. 500 cases, and now Nigeria, 2,500 uh, uh, 2, cases. We have now looked at these countries in details, and we asked ourselves the question, which phase of the pandemic are all 55, five countries there? Phase one or phase zero remain countries with uh, no cases there, and uh, they are just two. So far is Lesotho and the Sahara Republic. Then you have uh, four countries that are in phase one, that have just uh, uh, imported uh, uh, cases, and then 38 countries uh, begin to witness a, 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 a large explosion of, of cases within their population. And 11 countries are in phase three, which means we are seeing extensive community transmission. Then if you break down the countries very carefully and you say, well, healthcare workers are always the victims, and we saw in China, in Europe, and the United States that this category of, of workers or individuals are most at risk. And what is the situation in, on the continent? As we speak, about 614 healthcare workers have been uh, uh, infected. And this is, I highlight this because these are people that protect us. And we should make sure that in our strategy to fight COVID on the continent, we deliberately target them so that they, we prevent them from being infected. So of the approximately 43,000 individuals that were infected as of May 3rd, 614 of them have been infected. 42 of those from Central Africa, 28 in East Africa, 203 from North Africa, 96 from Southern Africa, and 245 from Western Africa. The question people are asking is, are mortality rates comparable to that in globally, and uh, uh, given that uh, we have several underlining conditions there. This graph shows you the, uh, the, the, the green line, that is vertical line shows you where the global case fatality rate is, and it's around close to 6, 6%. And you can read for yourself that several countries, including Burundi, Algeria, Zimbabwe, Gam uh, the Gambia, Liberia, Democratic Republic of Congo, are above the global average, but most countries in Africa are below or just around the, the, the global average in terms of the case fatality rate. So I think as a number increase, again, recall that we, we currently have 1,800 individuals who are infected and have died, and we are pulling that data together as a continental body to analyze, and these trends will become more obvious as we move forward. The lockdown has been, um, the leadership of the continent took very aggressive measures once the cases started arriving on the continent on the 14th of, of uh, February, and I'll come back to that. So the question that is asked is, is, has the lockdown benefited us? I guess the answer is clearly yes. And I would like to just uh, turn your attention to uh, the top four countries on the, the top panel of the slide that includes Algeria, South Africa, Morocco and Egypt. If you take South Africa, for example, the very top panel or the top role, at lockdown they had 709 cases and the rate of growth at lockdown on day one of lockdown was 31%. So they, if they hadn't locked down, the daily case growth would have been 31% increased daily. 21 days later, that number decreased to 5% after lockdown. So I think which means clearly and demonstrates that there was a significant benefit in, in locking down. And similarly in Algeria, before the lockdown, they had 200 cases with a 16% daily uh, growth rate. But as of 21 days later, that, that rate has decreased to 3%. And that clearly shows that the lockdown benefited. But now that countries are in the process of beginning to unlock their economies, uh, we, we are giving them advice with respect to what public health measures must be in place. Let me just switch attention now to the clinical trials that are going on on the continent, because as we all know, there are three things that must happen for us to completely win the battle against COVID-19. First, we have to have the diagnostics. Second, we have to have uh, vaccines that are, are accessible in an equitable manner. 
And thirdly, we have to have the drugs that are available. So it, it is very delighting to know that there are 29 clinical trials for uh, uh, treat therapies going on on the continent. That includes uh, 21 in Egypt, one in Zambia, two in South Africa, one in Nigeria, one in the Gambia, and, and four in, in, in Tunisia. So as you can clearly see on this slide, the whole question of chloroquine and hydrochloroquine is still being tested on the continent. And as a, a public health agency for the continent, our advice and guidance is that it should be restricted to only patients that are under uh, investigation so that they should be clearly monitored carefully. This is not time to recommend chloroquine and hydrochloroquine for general use. Let me now switch over to the response. So that's the situation. So what have we done as a continent? As I indicated earlier, once the leadership of the continent noticed that Egypt reported their first case on 14 of February, they convened an emergency meeting here in Addis Ababa under the leadership of uh, Chairperson Musa Fakib Mohammed. You can see uh, him on this picture with all the ministers of health, including the regional director of WHO Afro, Dr. Moeti, as well as the, 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 the leadership of the WHO from, uh, the, from Egypt. So that was a very important meeting. There were two major outcomes of the meeting. The first is that the ministers agreed on a continental joint strategy. That is underpinned by four things. One, they agreed that they will coordinate their efforts. Secondly, that they will cooperate in implementing the joint strategy. Thirdly, that they will collaborate share resources, and lastly, to communicate, that means sharing of data and information on almost real-time basis there. The uniqueness of the task force, which they set up, which is the second thing that they did, was to establish the African task force for the novel coronavirus uh, preparedness and response, was that the leadership and ownership of this should be jointly between the Africa CDC and member states. And this slide clearly shows you and it demonstrate that kind of joint ownership and leadership. For example, the Technical Working Group for Infection Prevention and Control is co-chaired by Dr. Chikwe, the director of the Nigeria CDC, who has done an outstanding job in, in fighting COVID-19 in Nigeria, and is co-chaired by a, 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 a colleague from the Africa CDC. The laboratory uh, uh, component of that is co-chaired by Dr. Amadou Sal, who is the director of the Pasteur Institute in Senegal. And uh, you can read the others on this slide. So this was a deliberate attempt to harness our assets on the continent as much as possible, working very closely with, with the World Health Organization, WHO. The second thing that is important to note is that the, the head of states and government, or the Bureau of the Head of States and Government endorsed that strategy on uh, the March 26th. And they have since put together a comprehensive framework, which at the very top is the Bureau of the Head of States, which meet nearly every week uh, to follow up and provide direction on the fight against COVID on the continent. And they have three ministerial coordinating committees. One of those is the Finance Committee that President Ramaphosa has put in place in, and with special invoices to work alongside multinationals and bilaterals to look into the economic impact of COVID on the continent. There's also a transport and logistic coordinating committee. And lastly, the health committee, which is co-chaired by the Minister of Health of South Africa and Commissioner Amira, who is the Commissioner of Social Affairs. As I indicated, we have the task force that develops the continental public health response strategy. And underneath that are technical working groups and the, uh, the, six or the seven working groups are indicated here. We also have a coordinated mechanism with the regional uh, uh, economic blocks that is for East Africa, the Central Africa, the West, the Southern and, and Northern Africa. And these groups, they meet every uh, Monday. Our last meeting was just yesterday at 12 o'clock East African time uh, to review uh, the implementation mechanism. So what is the strategy about? The strategy, the continental public health response strategy is anchored on three pillars. One is to prevent transmission. The second is to prevent deaths. And the last is to prevent harm. And harm here is used <clears throat> broadly to include uh, the, the human rights issues, to include uh, the harm and protection from uh, 
on HIV, TB, malaria, non-communicable, and maternal child health programs. On this, I'll, before I go back to the prevention and preventing death uh, strategy, is to really highlight the importance of this harm component. So many individuals died in West Africa during the uh, Ebola outbreak because of Ebola, not from Ebola. They died from other diseases. So we have very, very cognizance of this in designing our strategy. So those are the three pillars of the strategy. Let me now uh, also mention that the head of states have established the African Union COVID Response Fund. And is, the goal is to support two things. Firstly, is to support commodities that are needed to, uh, uh, to, for us to adequately respond uh, and to the three uh, pillars that are indicated. Secondly, is to deploy responders across member states who are in need of help in the spirit of expressing continental solidarity. I will now share with you what we've done as and the Africa CDC in partnership with member states along the, the seven uh, work streams that are indicated. First of all, once we knew that we were at threat, we immediately organized ourselves by pulling countries together and training them on enhanced techniques to conduct surveillance and enhanced airport screening. Uh, and we've trained over uh, 18 countries uh, where we brought airlines and airports and ministers of health experts as you can see them on the slide, on uh, the, the, the pictures on the left, and train them on how to conduct effective surveillance uh, to prevent the infection. At that time, recall, there were less than, uh, just, just Egypt had reported a case on the continent. The second area we focused on was to train uh, 22 countries on techniques to enhance infection prevention and control uh, uh, capacity. And we conducted that workshop in Nigeria with the Nigeria CDC between February uh, 21st and 25th in Abuja. The third area of interest was a risk communication and clinical care and management, where we brought together 25 countries rather quickly on almost back-to-back -back basis and trained them on uh, their skill sets to enhance risk communication and mitigate the risk, as well as uh, clinical care and management. And lastly, on diagnostics, let me just use this opportunity to make a very important point that if COVID had appeared on the continent in January, there wouldn't have been one single country of the 55 with any capabilities to diagnose it because we just didn't have that, that capacity and reagents. In February, the first week of February, Senegal and South Africa had developed that capacity. So as an African CDC, we use those two countries rapidly to train and scale up diagnostics to 43 countries in just uh, less than three weeks. It is thanks to that capacity that the continent was armed and was able to begin to dictate cases as uh, we started having imported cases across the continent. And this slide just summarizes for you what um, uh, the picture of what I just painted. For instance, we've distributed since the training and building out of capacity more than 1,500 uh, 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 commodities across the continent. We have now rolled out more than 100,000 tests, over a million uh, uh, of those uh, 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 by Africa CDC, and almost a million that was donated by the Jack Ma Foundation have also been distributed. We've trained over 4,000 clinicians on case management for COVID infection, and as I said, trained over 40 countries on their ability to uh, implement effective in, uh, in, uh, infection prevention and control measures. 26 countries have been trained on risk communication and our science standard and regulatory group is an, continues to analyze the data. So let me just move on to what we need to do to move the continent forward as we are in a long journey, a journey that we are just beginning, uh, we are just at the beginning of it and a journey that we must arm ourselves to, to, for a marathon, not a sprint. So if you ask the question, what are, what are our projections going forward in the next 100 days? What you see in front of you here are this, uh, uh, two lines. The red line uh, is a scenario that says if we implement less effective measures of containment, what will happen? And we are projecting based on modeling. And again, I insist this is based on modeling and assumptions that in the next three months to four months, we may, if, and a big if, if we do not have a strong containment strategies, 
we head into about 3 million, 3.8 million cases. But if we continue to tighten our, uh, uh, public health measures and, and have an effective implementation, the next three months we may be uh, hitting very, very quickly about 700,000 individuals who will be infected. And that is significant because these are the projections that are allowing us to uh, determine the number of needs that are required for us to, to fight this battle in terms of the beds, in terms of the medical supplies, in terms of the public, uh, uh, in terms of the, the, the personal protective equipment and the diagnostics. Just to highlight that diagnostics alone, if in the next um, uh, 100 days, uh, our cases are uh, projected, if this modeling is right, then we'll need 20 million tests in the next uh, three, to, uh, three to four months. And this slide shows you uh, and it, as the scenario in the less uh, if effective measure, it will cost the continent about $1.7 billion to cope with the situation if we have to go to the 3.8 million cases in the next 100 days. And uh, the items in, uh, you, you see here, that is the personal protective equipment, the, the mask, the gloves, the oxygen concentration, and et cetera, are all indicated here. And these are based on assumptions that 81% of our cases will be mild, 14% will be severe, and 5% of those cases will be critical. And that will be needing diagnostics to, uh, to test, uh, isolate, and trace people if 0.3% of our population <clears throat> is infected. And that if we conduct 50% of the close contacts actively, and then we test uh, all individuals that are hospitalized and are discharged. Uh, supply uh, chain management is based on the WHO uh, assumptions and the costing as well is based on the WHO forecasting them. So let me just uh, segue into the testing. As we speak today, the continent of 1.2 to 1.3 billion has tested 840,000 individuals which is remarkably low. And because of that, we have launched an initiative called the Partnership to Accelerate COVID Testing, whose aim is to increase that number by 1 million tests, an additional 1 million tests in just four weeks. And then in the next four months or so, or to, 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 uh, we should increase that number by 10 million uh, uh, tests in order to be at par with what we, we see happening in, in Italy, South Korea, and, and the, the, the US. So the partnership, which we are abbreviating PAC, again, uh, P stands for partnership, A for accelerated, C for COVID, and T for testing, has this following components. One, we want to engage the private sector very actively. We, we know and recognize that the private sector in the broadest sense of it uh, has to play a critical role in this. Second is that we need to deploy technology as much as possible and engage our community healthcare workers and community workers as much as possible. And lastly, that we have, we as a continent must engage in local manufacturing uh, in order to cope with the, the needs that are just projected. So let me just take you a little bit into the, the PAC st strategy, which will be the, the cornerstone for our response going forward. I indicated already that in the next four months we'll need about 10 million tests. We, as we speak, are putting together a pool mechanism coordinated by the African CDC and the African Union, where we we'll, uh, collect projections of commodities from member states and then uh, facilitate the discussion. They become the interface with the dialogue with the manufacturers globally. We'll also be looking at establishing a distribution hub here in Addis Ababa. As a continental public health agency, we are calling on 1 million healthcare health workers not necessarily healthcare workers to be deployed to support contact tracing. And as I indicated earlier, we need to back this up seriously by uh, any form of technology and innovation. And this slide just shows you uh, the, uh, the, the recent donation we received from the, the, the Jack Ma Foundation. And it's important to note that uh, no one strategy in terms of scaling up diagnostics will be, uh, 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 we shall not restrict ourselves to one strategy. We, we are counting on the huge infrastructure that the, the PEPFAR program uh, put in place across the continent to roll out diagnostics. 
I think we know that Africans know how to test. We test millions and millions of people every year for TB, HIV, and malaria, thanks to a lot of the support from the Global Fund and the PEPFAR program. And that's a backbone, a wonderful backbone that we should build on to roll out testing across the continent. We, in the next couple of days, will be deploying about 500 responders to countries that are requesting us to support their response strategy as much as possible so that they can adequately scale up the testing, conduct the isolation and contact tracing, and uh, make sure that uh, they isolate individuals that are infected. Just to, uh, in conclusion, I would like to um, say, address the question, what are the five most important things that we need to do as uh, uh, we, we, we look into the future? First, we, let's join forces. Uh, in forces with the private sector, the community, the business, and the philanthropies to support the scale up of the testing. Again, the, the underpinning of that, the pack is what we call the track, the test, the trace, and the treatment. That will allow us to not just uh, fight back and, 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 and win in the, the transmission lane, but will also limit the number of people, the deaths that may occur in our community, which we have not adequately prepared for. The second thing is the partnership to deploy community workers and healthcare workers, that the foot soldiers that are required to fight this fight. The third area is to continue to expand our clinical care and management uh, uh, facilities. And fourthly is to prevent our precious limited healthcare workers. I shared some data with you, which is a very worrying trend that already a, a very large number of our healthcare workers are already infected. And lastly, is to protect the existing programs, i.e. the TB programs, the HIV programs, and malaria programs, knowing that a combination of these three diseases leads to the death of over 1.2 million in Africans every year. So we must continue to protect them as much as possible. I know the other area people are asking is where can we contribute? I've indicated the fund. The AU uh, uh, COVID response fund is one avenue that the head of states and the private sector are contributing. Another area is the, the African Public Health Foundation that you can actually channel your, your efforts to. That will give a long-term uh, 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 opportunity to respond. I think this is uh, a registered, it's a 501c registered uh, foundation in, in uh, uh, Nairobi. And, uh, it was uh, acclaimed at the last World Economic Forum, as you can see on this slide, as one of the innovations that will help the continent to respond to uh, disease out outbreaks. And at this note, I would like to recognize uh, Wimot Allen and, and uh, 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 Amit, Dr. Amit Teka for their considerable efforts in setting up this uh, foundation in partnership with the Africa Citizen. And the logo of the foundation is indicated here. You can almost channel your, all your support to it. Let me just end also by acknowledging multiple partners that have really supported us tremendously. The Gates, uh, for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Score Foundation, the Welcome Trust, the UNDP, the NEPAD, AFINET and ASLM are strong implementing partners. The US government and the Chinese government and the British governments have been with us since the start of this very, very uh, uh, important fight. Thank you, Mayor, uh, 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 Mayor let me turn this over back to you. Thank you very much, Director uh, Kengasson. Um, and thank you so much for the leadership at this very critical time uh, in Africa. Um, I think we will have, you know, most of the audience probably has a lot of questions to ask. But at this point, um, you know, we would like to get some remarks from um, the US Ambassador to the African Union. We're very delighted that um, Ambassador Jessica Le Pen could join us today. So we would like to. Um, Give an opportunity for her to make some remarks first. Ambassador? Wonderful. Thanks so much. Thanks so much um, for organizing today's extraordinary event um, and, and, um, and for um, inviting me to participate. Um, I should say in February when Congresswoman Bass was in Addis, I had the honor of uh, participating in the AU Summit with her, so I'm thrilled to I guess, see her again um, in this format. Um, and I've done a number of Washington events by Zoom with Dr. John in recent weeks, and um, I never stop learning from him. And so I, I thank him and really shout out his experience, his expertise, and most importantly, his leadership 
which means so much across the continent as we all face this epidemic together. Um, I'll offer some brief comments that I think will, will echo or complement some of those of Dr. John's. My point of departure is, is to think about, to situate Africa CDC as a technical agency, but one that is an organ of a member state organization of the AU. And that structure can create challenges, complications, but it's ultimately enormously powerful because it's a place that brings together then the political and the technical aspects, um, which are gonna be crucial for, for bringing solutions. So from my perspective, um, sitting here in Addis, Oh, I say sitting in Addis, but probably like, like most of us on this call today, I'm, I'm pretty much locked down. Um, but from the perspective in Addis, I've been struck by the work of the AU to coordinate and to integrate a continental response. Dr. John um, mentioned it, but I want to underscore it and call it out because um, in a way it sounds very obvious. How can you not take a transnational approach to a transnational threat. But in fact, initial responses and almost instinctive responses to such a pernicious virus were in fact the opposite. It was to close airports, to roll up borders. Um, and so I, I think that the, the efforts at the head of state uh, level really can't be taken for granted. Um, and you saw on some of the slides just now what the, what the structures look like. And I, I think um, it's important to understand that they operate at the political level, meaning a group of nine or so heads of state meet every other week with the chairperson of the AU commission, then the ministers, as Dr. John described, meet every week. And, um, and then there is this other piece, which is the, the COVID response fund. All these three aspects of the solution have then head of state political buy-in, but crucially, Africa's CDC plays a secretariat function for all of them. Um, U.S. government has been, has been really proud and privileged to have partnered with Africa's CDC from the very beginning, from its establishment in 2017. And I, I would describe our support to Africa's CDC as being really consistent and similar to our support for national public health institutes um, in many countries across the continent, on a bilateral basis. And um, Africa CDC, interestingly, was, was in many ways modeled after the, the US CDC. And over the, the course of its, its short lifetime, we've always positioned CDC epidemiologists there to, um, to transfer skills, to build capacity. I would highlight our technical assistance in, in surveillance, in labs, in epi, um, as being very much so in the broader context of U.S. commitment to public health in Africa over the past two decades. Uh, the, the platform that Dr. John referred to of PEPFAR or PMI, the President's Malaria Initiative, in recent years, or the last year plus, of GHSA, the Global Health Security Agenda, all of these um, are over $60 billion in US assistance, and all of them have been crucial in creating a platform which is then available. And that platform also crucially includes um, technical capacity. Um, but we, we know very, very well that the US government um, contribution is only one part of the US contribution. And I, I wanna make sure I acknowledge that, particularly in this group, particularly with CFA, um, that the, the non-government aspects of the solutions will also be very, very important. So the contributions, for example, of the Gates and Skoll Foundations in the last few months for Africa CDC alone have been $8 million, in addition to, to other significant contributions in Africa. And then I, I really appreciated um, the chairperson's um, reference in the beginning to, to the importance of bringing in the private sector. Um, notably, Dr. John and I spoke a couple of weeks ago to over 200 US companies, all members of Corporate Council on Africa and the US Chamber to talk about partnership between, um, between Africa CDC and the AU and US uh, private sector. And I, um, I, I would, as an example, frankly, offer a recent contribution from Illumina 
which is a California-based company that does uh, genetic sequencing. And they have provided um, almost $2 million in, in assistance to Africa CDC. And obviously, they are, um, the sequencing, it, it's, it's much more sophisticated equipment. And so they're very much building on the kinds of, of platforms that we've talked about. Um, but those, those platforms represent almost a billion dollars in, in U.S. assistance over the last decade plus. Um, so I, I, I'm really pleased that, that there is this um, concurrence, if you will, around the private sector, around foundations, as well as government, and how do we pull all of these pieces together. Um, and with that, I thank you very much for including me today. Um, there are many, many speakers, so I'll leave it at that. Very much looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador LaPayne. Uh, I think it's really important that you know you are working in concert with the Africa CDC to support Africa in these efforts. And I think the key point you made about the private sector is quite important. Um, and during the panel discussion today, we're actually going to include, we're going to have a number of distinguished panelists who are part of the private sector, uh, who are going to be seeing how they can also partner. Obviously, they're based um, in the diaspora. But I think that was a very important point. So thank you so much for uh, your leadership and your partnership in this effort. So um, we would like to move on to get also comments, uh, remarks from our partner uh, organizing institution here, uh, John, Johns Hopkins University. So we've actually had um, a very distinct pleasure of working with, uh, you know, Professor James Calvin, who is the acting director of the um, Africana Studies Center at John, Johns Hopkins University. So before we um, go to questions, more questions from the audience, I would like uh, us to give an opportunity for him to make some remarks. Yeah. Professor James. Good morning all, can everyone hear me? Loud and clear. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity uh, to be a partner uh, today. Uh, and I'm very much looking forward to my colleague, uh, Dr. John Sampson, uh, who will be on the panelists, uh, be one of the panelists later. Uh, I did want to say just very briefly, the Center for Africana Studies uh, at Johns Hopkins is multidisciplinary. Uh, so we are certainly partnering uh, not only in the US, uh, but globally uh, through our faculty and, and research colleagues in the areas of, of health, uh, science, uh, certainly uh, policy, global policy uh, in the public health space. And, and so uh, there are three things that stood out to me uh, and seeking to anticipate uh, what the dialogue and conversation would be. And, and I wanna begin uh, my brief remarks by echoing uh, what uh, our, the ambassador uh, recently shared that uh, Dr. Uh, John uh, Nikasan uh, really laid out uh, very effectively uh, a very clear uh, set of uh, circumstances uh, and what I wanted to uh, address uh, really uh, in my comments are related to the capacity and the ability of, of the system and structure uh, of response in terms of, of how the continent uh, and the AU in particular, African Union, and those bodies and organizations uh, that are now coming forward towards that response. Uh, what I was listening for and what I heard uh, very uh, strong and, and very clear uh, was the idea of coordination uh, and governance. And, and so I think the comments that I heard a few minutes ago uh, in terms of governance uh, matter, but the two really need to be balanced, uh, I think, in uh, in a very future-oriented way. And, and what I'm getting at there in, in terms of uh, my response uh, and comment is that uh, the indicators uh, point to several things, that this is a long-term event, and the level and quality and, and types of coordination and governance uh, and the partnerships that are forming uh, not only with the, the health and, and scientific community, 
but with uh, public sector partners and, and private partners uh, is, is multidimensional. And, and so uh, one question that I do have uh, is what's the expanded view uh, going to build to and begin to look like uh, as we move into 2021 and 2022? Uh, one of the reasons for that is while the efforts uh, are underway and uh, everything I've heard today and, and read before today and, and in preparing uh, to be a part of, of what's happening in this very significant meeting is there are longer term economic uh, and livelihood impacts. Uh, so yes, I think we all agree um, uh, to, a, to a person uh, that we're going to find a way to, to both live with this by overcoming uh, its impacts as we understand COVID-19 uh, much more in Africa and indeed around the world. Uh, so if in fact uh, COVID-19 is now going to be a part of, of what we must navigate, uh, in the world, uh, certainly in Africa and across the diaspora, uh, and thinking of those five factors at the end, then uh, the current system and the current structure uh, that looks to me to be very uh, focused, uh, scaling certain things will need to be scaled uh, further, uh, more development in terms of capacity uh, in, in the work that I do with colleagues. I think that that's important. Uh, so what I would like to uh, perhaps end on uh, in this view that I'm presenting is that while we're scaling up and scaling out uh, strategic investments, uh, uh, partnerships uh, are going forward, uh, that there really does need to be uh, a stronger emphasis, and that's probably there, on sustaining the effort forward uh, uh, because of just the uh, enormous uh, amount of effort that it's going to take uh, on this continent of, of Africa, the diaspora, uh, but it really does mean that uh, this is a long-term proposition and having systems and structures and the willingness and the capability to have some flexibility in those systems and structures uh, I think is uh, also going to to be necessary. So as long as the level uh, and the degree of cooperation uh, that we're hearing today, I'm hearing today, not having been intimately uh, a part of of how this is built and, and come forward. So it's certainly a learning opportunity uh, for me. But I think my colleagues uh, at the Center for Africana Studies uh, in their work and ideas and our partners at Harvard uh, and the many institutions, that's part of the value of having this international uh, conversation uh, as the action continues. Uh, so we commit to uh, being a part of an ongoing process uh, and I'll, I'll pause there uh, and just want to say that uh, what is taking place uh, from my view uh, today uh, is necessary but do want to see some expansion of it uh, and I hope I've offered a couple of, of uh, thoughts towards that expansion in terms of the system uh, that's in place, uh, continuing to expand in a thoughtful, clear way. Uh, and there are reasons for that uh, because it's a longer term. So this is a beginning, a response to a beginning. Uh, things continue forward. And so having the capability and the capacity uh, to meet uh, the need uh, is ongoing. And so how uh, the system uh, can adapt uh, and the structures can adapt 
uh, to keep up with the challenge and in fact, get ahead of the challenge. So I'll pause there and thank you for this opportunity uh, to, to add my thoughts. And I hope uh, that there's more coherence in what I was saying, uh, but uh, very much see uh, the thinking and the work, the coordination uh, and the engagement. So thank I'll pause there. thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Calvin. Um, I think I would like to give John uh, a second to kind of respond to the idea of the long term uh, into the future and the sustainability of this uh, partnership, which you are kind of building with the diaspora. John, would you like to make some remarks? Absolutely. I think um, this, this were very thoughtful comments, and I would, uh, let me step back and uh, commend uh, Ambassador Lapen for uh, her great um, support for Africa, as, uh, uh, probably heard in Africa, a uh, long experience in Africa has actually uh, been brought to bear in these uh, very difficult circumstances that we are living with uh, with COVID response on the continent. Uh, let me uh, perhaps make a statement that I would, um, I hope uh, I will be uh, right uh, in, in, in future that the, the continent, public health practice on the continent of Africa must be different after COVID-19 is over. I think uh, Ambassador Le Pen offered some of those. Uh, the, the, the extraordinary potential at this point that Africa CDC as a new construct and a new architecture for public health on the continent brings to bear by its close location within the African Union Commission offers hope for, for the future for Africa that uh, it can speak to the kind of circumstances that um, uh, 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 Dr. James uh, Calvin uh, 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 spoke to. And it all and will continue to be the, the based on the ability to harness the assets, the public health assets and capabilities and capital that exists within the continent going forward. I will be surprised that after COVID-19 is over, uh, public health practice continues to be the way that it was before COVID-19 on the continent. We just don't know where with the trajectory, our trajectory uh, is heading to on the continent. The next couple of weeks will uh, be more illuminating for us, but clearly the, the ability to co coordinate our efforts, cooperate across the board and collaborate will be the underpinning and will define a new way, a new public health order for the continent going forward. Thank you very much, John. Um, we would like to uh, also have a brief feedback from young people uh, who are quite, quite important in this effort. Uh, so I'm going to give an opportunity, a minute, for um, one of our outstanding students at Harvard Medical School, um, S.C.S. Bedinger. Uh, he's a Harvard University Presidential Scholar and is part of the leadership at the Harvard uh, T.H. Chan School of Public Health uh, in trying to mobilize support for Africa. So I would like, uh, Isias, are you there? Can you make some remarks? Yes, I'm here. <clears throat> so thank you for your remarks, Dr. Nkengasan, for, um, for your work also in leadership. So you've already mentioned a lot of challenges that Africa is facing in addressing this pandemic. So my points will touch more on other challenges and, which, and ways in which the younger, um, the young members of the diaspora can help. So as we know, conflict and climate change have given rise to crowded refugee camps and IDPs, where it is very difficult to implement um, policies such as social distancing or even basic wash, uh, hand washing. We also need to note that 70% of the population depends on the informal economy to survive every day. And that lockdowns are not a luxury like in other countries, but poverty turns lockdowns into a death sentence. So reading some of the articles, um, someone actually commented that coronavirus was not going to be the killer, but rather starvation. So my question here is, have there been any economic support plans um, in place on the continent? As uh, Another thing is, uh, I want to point uh, to mention the environment that allows uh, misinformation to thrive in the place of leadership. So in fact, where there is mistrust in the government, misinformation plays a key role in undermining containment efforts and encourage citizens to act in contradiction um, to the advice of public health authorities. So misinformation has mainly been seen on social media, especially on WhatsApp where fake coronavirus cures and um, self-check methods were shared. But we see also um, the rise of like um, 
governments in trying to contain that, where they partnered with uh, social media, such as WhatsApp, in order to, uh, to set up um, support services to provide information on coronavirus to citizens. My last point is touches on how uh, young students around the world can, um, um, can help. So for example, this past weekend, I personally participated in, uh, in the virtual MIT COVID-19 Challenge Hackathon, um, where, uh, which consisted in designing and building local solutions to COVID-19 pandemic in Africa. So around 1,500 participants around the world entered the competition, and my team actually won the competition in the Empowering the Health Worker First Track. So our project called uh, CHIN, which was the COVID-19 Healthcare Information Integration Network, is an SMS-based platform for COVID-19 related information dis dissemination to healthcare workers. So these kind of activities that mobilize efforts from young Africans to support the communities and home country is very critical. Personally, another way um, that students at institutions like Harvard or other institutions can serve as bridges with trustable institutions back on the continent in order to filter the misinformation which is spreading uh, back on the continent, uh, um, which, is, uh, which is spreading as fast as the virus. So for example, in Ghana, uh, the diaspora created COVID-19 groups on social media to share um, um, information, point out fake news and myth, and supply fact check information to users. So along the same line, we can talk about the intellectual contribution from students and diaspora in research on coronavirus and dissemination of the research results. Another point is also to support investments in healthcare infrastructure, like you've mentioned, and equipment in the respective countries of origin. For example, in Ghana or even in Chad, the diaspora created platforms to, to fundraise for PPEs or even support aging parents or to buy extra food. So all that are my, my thoughts and questions that I had. So I will pause there and uh, thank you for this opportunity for like sharing my, my ideas and questions. Thank you, SES. Yes. Uh, Director Kengaso, do you want to say something to that? Yes, I mean, very um, extremely insightful comments, all of them. Um, let me perhaps uh, start with the last one, which is about um, the, the investment and contributions that you, uh, you can bring to, to bear. Just, just this morning, I had a conversation with a, a colleague uh, um, who is also working with a, a, a young or the youth uh, movement across the AU. And um, I was saying that there must be something that um, the, the younger generation uh, or the youth generation has to do uh, to contribute to this. This is uh, one event in 100 years that is, will be generational and it will be taught in, in schools of public health and schools of medicine going forward way after uh, we have left the stage uh, and retired from public health. So and the key question will be asked, what do the young people do? Uh, in this uh, in this space, and what happened, uh, what changes occurred because of the young people, not in spite of the young people. So I'm, I'm really pleased to hear the innovation, and that and young people can contribute in two ways, which you touch on. One is the innovation. I mean, the engine of innovation resides with the young uh, younger uh, population, and I think I'm pleased to hear your hackathon uh, contest and congratulations for that. The secondly is the the, the physical contribution. I think uh, when I've dressed young people, I've said this is the time for us to create a movement and uh, uh, a movement of young people against COVID-19 in Africa. A movement that brings uh, the young people, not just uh, in the United States, but across Europe, uh, Af uh, Afri uh, Africans in the diaspora in Europe and uh, North America and connecting with the young people on the continent to create a movement of of, of we, the young people, against COVID-19 on the continent, and I've uh, 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 indicated avenues that such um, movements can channel their resources. Let's just imagine for one second that uh, each young person across uh, North America, from the diaspora, from North America, Europe, and Africa, contributes two dollars to the foundation, and uh, we're targeting 100 million young people. That would be substantial amount of money to support 55 countries in Africa that are really struggling. So I think uh, the opportunities are there. Let's get ourselves organized. The second thing is that we will, as I indicated in my uh, submission, that uh, the solution to, 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 to the victory against COVID-19 resides in three things. 
uh, uh, diagnostics, vaccines, and treatment. Uh, we're currently using pop traditional public health methods that would help us uh, push back the, 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 the virus. But if we truly would need to come back to normalcy and go back to where we were before, we need those three things there. And it would require good science and good innovation there. And the best decisions are the decisions that are informed decisions, are decisions that are informed by good science and good innovation. So innovation will be at the center of this, uh, the, the, the fight if we want to get back to normal. Otherwise, we'll be establishing a new normal as, uh, and, and living with, with the virus, which we don't want to. Uh, the third thing was you know, they really, you, we are spot on, on the, the trust or mistrust that uh, exists. Now, this is not unique for, for um, COVID-19. We know that uh, for HIV, uh, TB and others, for a disease that doesn't have uh, a, a treatment or vaccines, it creates so much room for, for distrust, for stigmatization, for discrimination. We should fight against that. I think um, we, this is a long fight that has a multi-dimensional, including the, 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 the centrality of this is human rights at the center of this. I think we should have to be sure that it is there. And some of these human rights issues are fueled by misinformation and, and discrimination are fueled by uh, misinformation. The, uh, that is out there, the, the, the social media, and the young people have, uh, I believe, have a solution, should be a part of the solution to this by creating different social media outlets and using those to fight misinformation and, and making sure that the accurate information uh, uh, is uh, at least more consumed than misinformation. Lastly, on the um, issue of economic support, uh, President Ramaphosa, the chair of the Africa the, the Union, has actually uh, put in place um, a start of uh, very renowned Africans that uh, he's calling uh, economic envoys for the COVID response. And they include people like Dr. Ngozi, Dr. Dona Kaburuka, the former director of, of the president of the African Development Bank, and, and a host of others. I think they are out there engaging and working with the different uh, multinational bodies to chat out uh, an uh, uh, economic I'll call it in quote unquote stimulus packet for the continent. The finance ministers are also meeting, have participated in uh, 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 at least two meetings with the finance ministers where they are uh, uh, putting forward a plan of about $100 billion to uh, economic support for the continent. So this fight is not only fought as, as a, a herd respond uh, 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 coordination, but it's benefiting from the economic response uh, the coordination under the, the able leadership of President Ramaphosa and the chair of the African Union Commission, uh, Chairperson Musa Faki. Thank you very much, uh, Director Kengasong. I think one of the things that really made me smile was uh, the idea of young people uh, united against COVID-19 in Africa, <laughs> that kind of initiative. I think that's a challenge for you this year. Uh, you need to talk to your um, colleagues, uh, you know, young people to mobilize that kind of effort. I know you're already doing a lot uh, with your innovation and, um, and, and, and advocacy. So I think that's a really good, um, you know, call for you, call to action for you guys as well. Um, in the interest of time, I think we will move to the panel discussion uh, and then we'll give more time to question for questions at the end. Um, at this time, you know, I would like to introduce our distinguished uh, panelists. Um, and what will happen is that I'll basically introduce each panelist and then we'll have them make some remarks. Because of time, we we'll, we'll request that you limit your remarks to about four minutes. Um, and then after that, uh, we'll have the next panelist and then we'll have Q&A at the end of that. So without much ado, I would like to uh, introduce our first distinguished panelist for today. Um, uh, you know, he is no other than Dikembe Mutombo, an NBA legend. Dikembe Mutombo hails from the Democratic Republic of Congo. In 1987, uh, Mutombo was a recipient of the USAID scholarship to attend Georgetown University, and he soon excelled both academically and in basketball. 18 seasons at the NBA as an NBA superstar culminated in Mutombo's induction into the, league, the league's converted Hall of Fame and the responsibility of promoting the game as the first NBA global ambassador. Thanks to his heart and his vision, uh, 
he, his insight and his tireless dedication to making a positive difference in the lives of others, Mutombo has leveraged his celebrity as an NBA superstar to become a well-known and most loved spokesman for the underserved, especially those living in the Democratic Republic of Congo uh, and throughout Africa. Since leaving the NBA, Mutombo has become a full-time advocate and ambassador for making sure that people in need will have access to health services, education, and economic opportunities. He is fluent in nine, in nine languages, including five African languages. And uh, Mutombo founded the Dikembe Mutombo Foundation in 1997, whose mission is to improve the health, education, and quality of life for the people of the Democratic Republic of Congo. One major project of the foundation was to construct the Mari Mutombo Hospital in the capital city of Nebraska. Uh, and this hospital was named in memory of Mutombo's mother. It opened in December 2007. And to date, almost 500,000 men, women, and children have been treated uh, through that hospital. Uh, Dikembe resides in Atlanta, Georgia, with his wife Rose and three kids. Thank you so much, Dikembe, for all that you've been doing for us. Um, we would like to give you an opportunity to make uh, some remarks. Thank you, Prince. I really appreciate that. I also want to thank uh, all the participants for taking time out of the busy schedule to be part of this COVID-19 crisis in the continent of Africa. Uh, I want to thank the Congresswoman for taking time out of her busy schedule from Capitol Hill to join us and uh, all the dignity, including the U.S. Ambassador in the African Union. But as we know that the continent of Africa has faced so many crises, the COVID-19 is not a faith crisis that we face on the continent. So we are praying that uh, somehow we will come through this together as a union by working together. All of the countries need to unite it with all the forces that we have with our knowledge on the common ground. How can we come out from this pandemic? The Dikembe Mutombo Foundation, which was created in 1997 uh, with my family, we have made a lot of progress. The hospital continues to serve the people in the Congo in particular, especially in the city of Kinshasa. We have treated more than a half a million women and children in general. But with this COVID-19, we don't know what the future look like. And then we're all just praying that uh, this enemy, invisible enemy, will not come to destroy the fabric of our society. Africa, you have no, we have faced already challenge with the HIV AIDS that was presented by Professor Castle, CDC. We have faced with TB, we have faced with malaria, which continue to kill more than 1.2 million Africans in the continent. And um, I believe there's something going on with COVID-19. We don't know why COVID is not spreading as fast as so many people thought it was going to spread in the continent. In the same token, we want to take some self-precaution and what tomorrow will be like, even though we don't see the spread of COVID-19 in an acceleration way, as we've seen in America, in Africa, and in Asia, especially, excuse me, in Europe. Um, Africa's this bigger challenge is a lack of doctors, lack of laboratory, uh, lack of healthcare symptoms. Most of the healthcare centers in the continent of Africa are an hour to a day walk or drive. So we don't know if this invisible enemy continues to spread. What our future of the next generation will be like. As we know, our young people in the continent almost cover almost all the continent. We see almost more than 65% of the population in Africa and the age of 24 years. Many of them have now reached 
the productive lab yet. So we have our work cut off, which we'll do will be to do the best as we can as people around the globe to save this beautiful young continent, which is about to face one of the biggest crises they've ever faced. I believe also, maybe with God, well, that the temperature in the continent, you have something to do um, with the cutting of the number of COVID-19 in the continent. Because when you look at the sanitary condition, the way people live in our continent, um, I'm wondering how miraculously we have seen that the number is not growing as fast as we see maybe in South Africa and in North of Africa. We are lucky in the South of Sahara that the number is not that big yet because I'm looking at some of the presentations that was given here by African CDC. Um, it's very alarming, but it's not too alarming. But uh, there's some measure and some precaution that we as a people, especially civilian, those with goodwill, uh, yet to do the best as we can to prepare ourselves. My question remains, who's going to help us to build the testing capacity uh, to attack uh, this pandemic that is coming in front of us. It's already in the continent. But how are we going to be able to test more than 1.3 billion people in the continent of Africa? We don't have the resources. Um, there's been some funds allocated for the continent. There's been some donation made to the continent. But people are dying every day. What are we doing tomorrow to save, to save this young youth? That's what scares me every day. That would make me lose my sleep every day. As someone who has been advocate uh, for the health in the continent for his, uh, of Africa, who have donated more than 30 some plus million dollars by building the healthcare facility and to continue to treat people. It's very scary to know what the future of the continent look like. And I applaud the African CDC applaud uh, CFA for the effort that they are doing to bring all of us together, especially all the participants, to make sure that uh, we are united, that we are talking about what is happening in the continent, that we are calling everyone to do his best, to do his part. So the future of our young people on future of this beautiful young continent that is so rich that can be saved. And um, I know there's a lot of participants who have to talk here today, but I will conclude that we need help. We need help from America, we need help from Europe, we need help from Asia. We know that those continents have faced the challenges and they continue to face it right now. The US, the prediction is very high with what is happening with COVID-19. Europe going to start seeing some decline, but Africa is in a big need right now. And everyone who felt like a can use his resources to help this continent. I think we African people and African from diaspora are really crying and they're waiting for this help to come. So I thank you so much for bringing me and I hope that uh, Africa of tomorrow will be a better continent than it is today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ndikembe. Uh, I mean, you are an example of what the diaspora can really do to support Africa. And I mean, this is the key for this particular panel. It's to kind of think about how the diaspora can support uh, John and the Africa CDC um, to um, be able to address this COVID-19. And uh, you, you set an example for us. Uh, and I think that the points you've made are very important. Um, I would like to uh, give a chance, maybe John, you wanna say 
just a 30 seconds to respond to that before I introduce the next panelist. I mean, uh, uh, yes, absolutely. I think uh, Dikembe touched on uh, several very important things on the continent, and which I don't need to, uh, to repeat. Uh, we are a continent with extremely fragile health systems and, um, uh, and healthcare uh, uh, systems. But you did touch on the, the, the key issue of, uh, you asked a question, who is going to do this for us? I think it's us, Africans. Africans in Africa, Africans in the diaspora. It is us, the collective uh, 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 force of goodwill, which is friends of Africa, allies of Africa, joining forces together and united for the, the common sake of uh, uh, the, 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 the well-being of, of Africans. A, a, a healthy Africa is a productive Africa and will be the, the engine for the future of, of Africa. I think as the continent strives to integrate through the Continental Free Trade Agreement, uh, which is part of our vision uh, to lift up the continent through using the roadmap that we laid out uh, as the African Union Commission called the, the Agenda 2063, the Africa we want. It requires effective partnerships and partnerships that include Africans regardless of wherever they live and work in, in the world. So I'm really looking forward uh, uh, today as an opportunity to begin that dialogue. That will be the first step that leads to a, a journey of 1,000 miles. Yeah. Thank you so much, John. I really agree with that. Um, so we are going to now uh, introduce our next panelist, distinguished panelist. Um, it's none other than Professor Wafai Ozi, who is a professor of population science and a professor of nutrition, epidemiology, and, of, and global health at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. He actually completed his medical training uh, at the University of Khartoum in Sudan and his doctorate in public health in 1992 in the Department of Epidemiology um, at Harvard. Uh, over the past 20 years, uh, Professor Fozai has led the design and implementation of NIH-funded um, randomized controlled trials. And uh, his studies have included examining the epidemiology of adverse pregnancy outcomes, childhood infections, HIV AIDS, uh, and other developing countries. We are very honored to have uh, Professor Fozai with us today. Uh, actually, one of the questions that showed up at the, on the chat round was, you know, John, what, what, what are we doing about the clinical trials? And I think uh, <laughs> I think that uh, Oza may be able to comment on that, and you can have some response and remarks on that too. Professor Fozai? Thank you so much, Will. Yes. Uh, hey. Thank you so much. Uh, it's an honor to participate uh, uh, on this panel with uh, many esteemed colleagues. Um, it's important to underscore a point that was already mentioned repeatedly about uh, the central role that uh, Africa CDC has been playing uh, on the continent uh, under the very able leadership of uh, Dr. Nkenga Song. Uh, for the first time, there is uh, a continental coordinated effort uh, that hasn't been the case really in prior epidemics, working with government and with public health uh, institutions uh, in the region. So everything that can be done to support Africa CDC and partner institutions uh, in uh, the countries is certainly um, necessary. Uh, which leads to the question, what can uh, Africans in the diaspora do uh, in that regard? I guess at the outset, um, I'd like to note that uh, it's not really a, a unidirectional uh, relationship. Uh, in as much as uh, the challenges are global and the spread of the virus uh, and infection does not recognize these imaginary borders that we have, the flow of solutions and innovations uh, is also uh, bidirectional. So there are many resources uh, on the continent, many scientists and innovators that are quite capable of advancing knowledge uh, for the people uh, on the continent and indeed uh, sharing those innovations uh, with the rest of the world. Um, less than a week after the first case was confirmed uh, in Nigeria, uh, there was a very fast uh, effort to um, sequence the genome uh, uh, in Nigeria uh, at Redeemer University in Nimer, uh, led by uh, African scientists um, with Nigeria CDC. And they have shared that knowledge very fast with the rest of the world and contributed to this surveillance of uh, the virus 
uh, and uh, whether there are mutations uh, that are appearing over time uh, in place. So, so the point really is that a partnership is the principle that we seek um, with uh, colleagues and institutions uh, on the continent. There are two points really, or two tracks for that partnership that I would um, uh, note. One um, is in the area of research, uh, and the other is in the area of capacity building uh, and training. And Africa CDC has been um, leading in, in coordinating this effort on both tracks. On research, there are a number of tracks that are uh, needed, um, really research on epidemiologic um, uh, methods, um, from uh, research to model the patterns of infection and spread um, in countries and uh, in regions and throughout the continent, understanding the impact on the healthcare system and on, on other aspects uh, of um, health, um, research on um, the epidemiology of uh, transmission dynamics that are unique to Africa, uh, what factors um, enable uh, a faster spread in certain settings and what cultural norms and, and, and practices might be uh, enabling that to inform uh, the response. Um, and then um, research also on um, sort of uh, trials, um, development of uh, new therapeutics, new vaccines uh, and diagnostics. Uh, this is an, an aspect that uh, the continent is not um, new to. There has been a lot of effort in that regard. Uh, on COVID-19 specifically, um, uh, there are ongoing efforts to develop um, rapid assay in Senegal, um, uh, led by scientists there uh, with uh, Pasteur Institute. Um, uh, Dr. Kenga Song noted that there, there are uh, more trials happening on the continent and noted there are 29 trials. Uh, I noted that 21 out of the 29 are in one country. And so there are um, sort of, uh, there is a long way to go really in um, enabling more research and more trials uh, on the continent. Uh, there is a concern that uh, it's quite limited contribution from Africa and African scientists um, in um, the development of vaccines uh, and therapeutics. Um, there are many challenges that are uh, obstacles on that road. Uh, there are challenges with regulatory processes um, that are slow, um, including um, institutional review boards that are important, but also the ability to import drugs and um, to participate in safety checks in a, in a fast way. Um, these are sort of bottlenecks that are um, critical and I wonder to what extent Africa CDC can play an enabling role to increase the capacity uh, to develop um, uh, those um, systems that enable uh, participation uh, in trials. And beyond um, doing trials on the continent and finding uh, drugs and vaccines, which uh, is ambitious but doable, um, uh, I also echo the, the sentiment that was noted earlier about sort of enhancing the manufacturing capacity uh, of um, these drugs and vaccines uh, on the continent. Um, and that's where um, the, the private sector can indeed uh, play a role. Uh, there are lots of raw material, lots of human resources. Uh, there is political will uh, in many um, corners of the continent. And um, the continental free trade agreement would also enable um, sort of scaling up that uh, intra-African um, uh, access to um, products that are developed on the continent. So um, on research, really, um, uh, there is a lot that Africans in the diaspora can, can contribute. Um, I would say it's an opportunity for uh, all uh, scientists and investors um, in the North, um, in Europe and in the US to contribute. Um, it's certainly a smart investment, uh, not only uh, in uh, the solutions, but also in advancing science. On the second point, very briefly around training, which is another key element, there are um, eminent leaders um, on the continent who are partners and colleagues and collaborators on many of our initiatives. And uh, with them, there are many opportunities to um, build the um, sort of capacity of uh, the younger generation uh, of scientists uh, on the continent. I believe, um, 
uh, a statistic that Dr. Kenga Song mentioned uh, at another time is that um, there are uh, 1,400 epidemiologists on the continent, but uh, by his estimates, uh, 6,000 are needed. And so um, there are already master's program and other degree programs on the continent that could be further strengthened in partnership with um, institutions in the North. Um, my own university, uh, Harvard, has been actively engaged in trading and other uh, US universities have. Um, thanks to a lot of support from the NIH, um, the Fogarty International Center, um, from uh, other um, eminent institutions. And I would end by saying that uh, a lot of the partnership happens um, and opportunities for sort of north, south, um, but uh, a lot can be done also and is being done um, within the continent itself. So uh, an effort that we are keen to, to strengthen and contribute to is sort of enabling south to south collaboration. Uh, and CDC has been a leader uh, in this area and um, certainly lots more opportunities for us to uh, advance both research and training in partnership with uh, institutions on the continent and uh, with African CDC. With that, I thank you again for including me and pass, pass it back to you, Will. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Fozer. I think that was really good that you actually commented on the clinical trials thing. Uh, that was one of the questions that was on our chat. So thank you very much for those remarks. Um, uh, we are going to introduce the next panelist, uh, who is, we are really delighted to have as well, Dr. Austin Denby. He is the Deputy Director of the Health Resources and Services Administration at the, at the Agency of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, uh, particularly in the Office of Global Health. He has served uh, as a Director and Deputy Principal for the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, PEPFAR, and uh, where he actually managed the department's two billion global health uh, HIV AIDS portfolio. In 2014 to 2015, Dr. Dembe played a key role in the US government response to the Ebola outbreak in Africa. We are so much, thank you so much, Dr. Dembe, that you could join us today. We'd like to give you a chance to make some remarks. Well, uh, thank you very much, and I really appreciate the opportunity. It's, it's great to see my uh, a colleague and friend, Dr. Kengesong, uh, from way back in the CDC days. Um, I'm participating here as a private citizen. I'm not representing the views of any U.S. government institution, even though I work for the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, for nearly 40 years experience working in global health, I bring some thoughts that you may find helpful in responding to the current COVID-19 pandemic as it continues to impact Africa. I would like to draw some clear lessons from the 2014-2016 Ebola virus outbreak in West Africa that you may find especially useful in addressing the current COVID-19 pandemic. With the Ebola virus outbreak, there were two distinct components of the response. Firstly, the biomedical response, which involves speedy and accurate diagnosis followed by patient isolation and effective case management. This meant quickly building up laboratory capability and capacity, especially functional beds, and ensuring that requisite doctors, nurses, and allied health staff were available and well-trained. With this approach as the principal focus initially, extremely sick Ebola cases quickly mounted in the hospitals, and the facilities were quickly overwhelmed. The result was the incredible loss of lives, including the death of significant proportion of healthcare workers, including doctors and nurses. The second part of the response that was overlooked in the beginning, but later proved to be critical in containing the outbreak, was community mobilization, and most importantly, community ownership of the response. The eminent virologists, doctors, and not nurses that we naturally gravitate to in these matters do not live in the average person's home and are not in the decision-making process to determine when or if a report of an illness is uh, made to the hospital or to manage a sick person at home or to report the death of a member of the household. Such important decisions are made by individuals, by families, by neighbors, when time and energy is invested in informing 
and better still, educating such communities, the first step would have been taken to meaningfully engage the local communities. The next critical step is empowering the local communities to take safe and prudent actions that protect themselves and their families. Following the establishment of a strong and knowledgeable local community, the next vital step is to create a compact, a partnership between the local community and their biomedical counterparts. With such a compact established, we saw the communities going out of their way to institute preventive measures at a personal, family, and community level. They also ensure that Ebola cases were identified early and messages sent to the alert centers for ambulance pickups. Similarly, they evolved an acceptance and strict enforcement of safe medical barriers for community members that died because of Ebola, an incredible cultural barrier to overcome. The net result of this compact between medical practitioners and the community was reflected in the dramatic reduction of new cases and the ultimate containment of the epidemic. The moral here is that we cannot treat our way out of these important community-driven outbreaks. It takes a strong partnership between the caregivers and the community they serve to contain these outbreaks. An important partner throughout the Ebola outbreak in West Africa was the highly active African diaspora community. There is a tendency for this community to focus on tried and tested Western based biomedical solutions. It is important though that a good balance is struck between the biomedical solutions and the community mobilization and community ownership that the diasporans could help with effectively. Through regular remittances, as well as an acknowledgement that the family, the neighborhood, the community have one of their own living in the West, gives the diaspora a powerful voice that could be used for good. This voice is not only important in advocating for resources in their countries of residence, it is one of the most potent tools for community mobilization in their home countries. Your families, your communities listen to you and trust you more than any eminent scientist or politician. I would only ask that we make those voices count. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Dembe. Um, I think uh, since you you know, you know John very well, I would actually want to have John uh, make some response <laughs> to that. John, you want to say anything to your friend? Uh, Austin, good to see you, and you are looking great as always. <laughs> so I, I can agree more on uh, uh, what uh, Austin uh, uh, really touched on, which is the community uh, uh, own and community led response. I think it has been one of my uh, most, um, I've actually been very deliberate and, and insistent on that. That it starts in the community and ends in the community. And if we have to win the battle against and the wars, sorry, against COVID. On the continent, uh, which we must uh, win to survive, uh, it has to be a community-owned and community-led. Which means we build trust with the community, we build champions in the communities, and we build leadership in the community. As uh, I mean, Austin rightly said, uh, biomedical interventions will come, and, and they're slowly, I mean, trickling down in, into the continent. But without that approach, I think we will have a, a, a long journey uh, to work, and we don't have time for that. So thank you, thank you, Austin, for those uh, words of wisdom. Thank you, John. Um, so one thing that uh, the Ambassador Lapin mentioned was the idea of a partnership with the private sector. Uh, our next distinguished panelist, is, uh, no, uh, it's not new to that. She's been a champion, um, Dr. Gloria Hendon, as the president of the GB, GB Group Global. Uh, she's actually an alumna of Johns Hopkins University, so I think Johns Hopkins should be very proud uh, <laughs> as partner here to actually see her participate as well. Um, Dr. Hendon also worked as a research fellow at the Brookings Institute and was a member of the Council on Foreign Relations at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Dr. Hendon stays active in both the business and local communities through associations such as the Smithsonian Corporate Advisory Board of Office Depot, uh, former American Express board member um, and Association for Community Colleges, American Association for Community Colleges, and also Association of Community College Trustee 
and U.S. Angola Chamber of Commerce. Um, we're very delighted that you have uh, Gloria with us today. Gloria? Good morning. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, to all my brothers and sisters, I wish you well. We are all in this boat together, undergoing one of the most difficult storms of our life. But uh, remember that after the storm, there is a rainbow. Let me uh, tell you what I really think has happened. This virus has demonstrated so many of the inefficiencies of uh, our global health uh, system. The lack of drugs that are needed, institutional and sanitation issues, communication and data, and the dichotomy between the political will and the scientific imperative. So what I'm gonna to bring to you today are in the next three or four minutes uh, are four functional solutions that have come out of the diaspora for this pandemic. Number one is a interesting immunotherapy drug called low-dose naltextron. We have done clinical trials for that in Nigeria, in Oshun State, and it's proven that it really boosts the immune system. LDN has two very defined and proven pharmacological characteristics that should help patients in the fight against COVID-19 and the virus that causes it, SARS-CoV-2. First, it modulates the immune system function to upregulate T cells, specifically the CD4, CD8, CD25, TREG, and NK cells in order to better fight the virus. Now, as people who have seen, who uh, this was created by Dr. Buhari, and he describes that also, that most people who use LDN don't get colds, which is a type of coronavirus, while using LDN. Secondly, LDN inhibits the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines through the antagonism of the toll-like receptor 4. Most critical COVID-19 patients die, you're generally due to the hyperinflammation caused by the cytokine storm. LDN reduces at least 50% of the known cytokine of regulated in late stages, CV19 patients. LDN has been tested and proven. It has been approved by NAFDAQ and it is effective against viral replication. Testing also is being initiated for non-pathogenic and pathogenic strains. Also, anecdotal evidence has proven that HIV positive patients in New York who, have L who use LDN have had positive outcomes with COVID-19. So this is one of our first practical solutions from the African diaspora for the decimation of this pandemic. The second is a telemedicine um, platform called Dokita. Remember this, www.dokita.io. Dokita is in uh, Swahili, doctor. This is an interactive global medicine, telemedicine platform. And on this platform, you can go in and have consultations with physicians all over the world. Also, this platform right now, there it has a testing center in Patterson, New Jersey, uh, overseen by Dr. Richard Afonja. This platform not only does consultations, but you can get prescriptions on this platform through the Dikita app. The great thing too about this is that you can have an African diaspora purchase uh, through this platform, the, uh, uh, the, the, the drugs for people on the continent. So this Dokita app and portal can provide a solution to providing services on the continent 
for patients who are suffering with any kind of condition, including COVID-19. A third as diaspora perform performance is the provision and the manufacturing on the continent of some uh, antimicrobials. This is done by a company out of Nashville, Tennessee, and, they are, and uh, the inventor of the process is a doctor from Morehouse College. And what they're doing is they are providing sanitizers they have um, antimicrobials that has bacterial statics, fungal statics, and algae static properties. And it's registered with EPA, and it has been proven and known to kill the virus. This is an African-American firm, and they are going to be manufacturing on the continent, but they also are supplying on the continent. That uh, product is called ADAPT. And it's used in hospitals, nursing homes, surgical centers, amusement parks, schools, universities. And in addition to that, they also have a patented product called Cleanup. And Cleanup kills noroviruses and all kinds of pathogens. And so that too, these are surface cleaners. These are not injectables. These are surface cleaners. But it helps to sanitize and helps to keep our environment clean and uh, ready to combat the COVID-19 virus. And a final, a fourth uh, uh, approach through the uh, African diaspora is the provision of PPEs. Not only the provision of PPEs, but the manufacture of PPEs on the continent. This is a new normal. People are gonna be wearing masks all the time now. People are gonna be, uh, they're taking their temperature when you go in any kind of social uh, environment. You're going to have to have wear gloves. The interesting thing that we found uh, even during this pro uh, process in the U.S. is very few of these PPEs are even produced in the U.S. You would dare not think that there's only one manufacturer of nitrile gloves in the U.S. Most of them come from China, Korea, Turkey, and that is a difficult situation, and you have the same thing on the continent. So what this diaspora company is doing with uh, GB Group Global is to manufacturing PPEs on the continent. And that means the, the masks, the surgical masks, the uh, gloves, and then they will move on to other uh, types of uh, personal uh, protective equipment. These relations and opportunities are, have already started. These are tangible solutions to some of our issues. And these are just a few of the African and African diaspora enterprises that are serving our community during this pan uh, pandemic. And I'm sure we're gonna have much more. So let's all work together and walk down this aisle together and create our own solutions to our own problems. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gloria. I mean, it's really important to take note of some of those uh, uh, suggestions you've made and be able to follow up on that, maybe to be done. Um, so now we are going to uh, move forward quickly to the next uh, distinguished panelist, and this is going to be Ambassador Alawele Mayugun. Uh, he's, he's a public policy expert, a former ambassador, and career diplomat in the Nigerian Foreign Services. He's a former director of the Department of Social Affairs at the African Union and was very instrumental in setting up the Africa CDC and led the African Union's effort in a border in West Africa. We're very honored and delighted to have uh, Ambassador Mayugo. Ambassador? Uh, th thank you very much, Dr. Nguan. Let, let, me, uh, let me start by saying that I feel so honored to be invited to be part of this um, the panelists here, and, and I want to start by thanking Dr. Melvin Foote, uh, Dr. Janice Scott, and Congresswoman uh, Karen Bass, and your good self, Dr. Ungwa. But more importantly, to express appreciation to my good friend, uh, John Nkegesang, uh, for his wonderful work uh, that he's been doing. But I also want to express appreciation to, uh, to Ambassador Jessica Lupin, Lupin and particularly her predecessors, 
Ambassador Leone, and in particular, uh, Ambassador Brigetti, who is the dean of, who is now the dean of Elliott School of International uh, Affairs uh, at Georgetown. I, I really want to thank them because, uh, as you introduced uh, during your introduction, sure, I was honored to be to have uh, led the Ebola response uh, of the African Union and in West Africa, but also the speedy establishment of the Africa's uh, of the Africa Centers for Disease Control. I'm glad today that uh, I was able to you know, get one of the diaspora, a war room, a room virologist in the person of Dr. Johnny Kagerson, to be the pioneer director. Just as the, the Ebola uh, gave birth to the Africa CDC, I'm confident that uh, the COVID-19 will take the Africa CDC uh, to the next level, given the tremendous work uh, in its short uh, uh, term of its establishment and under the leadership of John uh, to the next level. I'm going to be very straight to what are the things that the diaspora can do. Of course, like I said, the diaspora, uh, the, the United States was very, very supportive in the establishment of the Africa CDC. And thanks to quite a number of the efforts of some of you more folks in the diaspora for that. Uh, we've been told of the, of the fund, of the Africa Public Health Fund. I think it's the responsibility, or we should all do in making sure that that fund, uh, as it's taken off, uh, it's well uh, replenished. And I'm talking, I'm not talking about the one established by the African Union, I'm talking about the, the one based in Nairobi. Uh, we need to do all our best uh, to, to, get, to make sure that that is done. We should continue to mobilize support and advocacy for the Africa CDC uh, in the United States and in Europe uh, to continue to support the Africa CDC. Uh, strong advocacy, even at a time uh, when all, when the United States or countries in Europe are facing their own financial economic problem res resulting from COVID, uh, we should still be able to advocate that they need to support Africa CDC because the, the aim of the objective and the vision for the Africa CDC is to create a foremost health agency in Africa, is to create a situation where Africa is helping Africa, where we are increasing the capacity of African uh, countries to be able to meet their obligations under the international health regulations. And since the establishment of the Africa CDC, again, thanks to the leadership of John, we've seen a lot of capacity building we've, you know, being done even before the heartbreak of, of, of COVID. We need to continue this. And those of us, or those of you in the diaspora, we'll be instrumental to this uh, in, 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 in ensuring that the human resources for health is strengthened and adequate capacity building uh, is given. So these are, you know, John outlined for us the pact. The figures we are seeing right now in Africa, for me, is still a bit deceptive. It doesn't tell the story. But I'm sure and confident that with the pact, the partnership for accelerated uh, COVID testing, we can support the Africa CDC in making sure that they expand as rapidly and meet the objectives of one million uh, per week that they want to you know, that they want to conduct. It is doable. We did it once. Uh, we showed that Africa helping Africa, and when I say Africa helping Africa, it includes those in diaspora, wherever you are, and of course with the friends of Africa. Africa CDC remains, a, you know, a game changer in public health in Africa and we should all support it. Finally, before I go, because I, I know we've all been long, I always like to speak for the voiceless, the women, the children, who have been badly affected by COVID-19. Yes, John presented to us how the complete lockdown has had effect, but it's coming at a tremendous cost to women and children in particular, uh, we've seen the increased cases of mental health. We've seen the increased cases of 
uh, intimate partners violence. And we've seen the increased cases of, uh, of uh, child abuse and online sexual exploitation of children under this cover of lockdown. Those in diaspora, we should be able to be voice of the voiceless and we should support uh, the, the non-profit and the non-governmental organizations that are working on the field trying to look at these problems and render all the assistance that we can. Uh, on these notes, I'm going to stop. Let's continue to mobilize support. I want to thank the Congresswoman that as that we need the United States support. We need the continued support of the US CDC. And I hope that after the tenure of John, we could still get somebody from the diaspora that we continue the leadership of the Africa CDC. John, thank you very much. I'm proud to be, uh, to be associated and to continue to be a champion. And I'm very happy with what you are doing, uh, your efforts and those of your colleagues and with the support of those in the diaspora and all the countries that are supporting you, uh, Africa CDC is on the path to realizing that vision of being the foremost health agency in Africa and for Africa to continue to help Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, well said. Uh, we definitely are all behind uh, John. Uh, to succeed in this, uh, leading us in this fight in Africa. Um, we have a couple of last, last panelists that we will introduce now. One of them is uh, Professor um, John Thompson from South University. Uh, we, of just, we just to indicate that in a, a, about five minutes, I'll need to leave to join um, the, the, my next uh, schedule, unfortunately, which starts at 7.30, but I need to be online in 10 minutes before that. Okay, okay, great. So we'll quickly zoom through this now. <laughs> uh, Dr. Sampson, would you like to make some remarks? Yes, uh, I'm John Sampson from Johns Hopkins University. I work with the Center for Africana Studies um, at Johns Hopkins University and the Diaspora Africa Forum based in Accra, Ghana, which is partnered with the African Union. Um, we've been working, my group has been working with training healthcare providers in the continent for uh, probably about two decades now. And right now, um, we're very proud to be part of leadership in Africa, in West Africa, initiated by the president of Sierra Leone, who uh, with their Ministry of Health requested that our group actually engage in training of Sierra Leone frontline healthcare providers on mechanical ventilation and ICU management uh, instruction for COVID patients. And so we have actually, um, would, uh, actually have corporate support from a company called Gradient Health. Um, and uh, we are uh, pr practicing actually social distancing uh, principles and everything. So even though we're training quite a number of Sierra Leone doctors and nurses, um, we're actually doing it in small groups so that they can remain a certain amount apart from each other with, with face masks and everything. Um, we're using uh, medical simulation and Zoom in each training uh, group actually gets about 14 hours of training, very detailed on how to protect themselves from getting infected in the process of intubating a patient, in the process of extubating a patient, how to manage uh, ventilators that are specifically tailored for the African environment uh, appropriately, Many times ventilators are purchased that, uh, or medical equipment is purchased that won't necessarily work in, in Africa. And, and it may be uh, purchased with good intention, but uh, for this situation, we need ventilators that can work with various different types of oxygen, including an oxygen concentrator, and that have extensive battery backup. So this ventilator has like 12 hours battery backup um, for in case of extended power failures. Um, so uh, this uh, work, uh, hopefully, by working with the Diaspora Africa Forum and the African Union, we can hopefully disseminate this work into a training online training package that we're developing that can be available to uh, healthcare providers throughout the continent um, through uh, contact with the, both the African Union and the ECOWAS, and um, and. Uh, 
th this is very critical because at, at the end of the day, um, we actually don't have any uh, definite treatment for COVID-19. And most of our treatments are actually supportive care. Most of the treatments that we're discussing are things that are being researched and developed, and hopefully something will pan out that it really makes a difference. But with supportive care, um, a percentage of the population is at risk of death unless they get critical care. And critical care up to now has been something that has not been focused on in many of the countries. So I'm, I'm glad to see that certain uh, locations that we work with, like in Ethiopia, Nigeria, and Sierra Leone, are actually working to improve their critical care resources and looking to help empower their physicians to be able to manage even the sickest of the COVID patients. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, John. We'll definitely be working with you to see how we can coordinate that kind of wonderful initiative uh, to have an impact in Africa. Uh, because John is gonna leave, I'm gonna let uh, Mr. Melvin Ford make some remarks first uh, before uh, John leaves. Mel, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, first of all, John, I just wanna say thank you very much. Uh, I think this was enlightening. We certainly got a lot of work to do. This was our first time, but our yeah. first time out of the box. So we have a lot of work to do. I just wanna say thank you. I look forward to uh, continuing to work with you. I've known you uh, since 2017 when they launched the Africa CDC. And I know of your commitment. I know what you're about. And I know of your passion for not only uh, addressing issues like the, the pandemic, but helping to build the healthcare infrastructure in Africa. Uh, you know, the, the COVID-19 is horrible, but we got to build the healthcare infrastructure in Africa. And we, uh, CFA is certainly looking forward to working with you uh, in that regard. So thank you very much. Uh, I mean, if I, if I may chime in also, this is Camille. Greetings to everybody from Lagos. Uh, just before Dr. John leaves, I uh, just wanted to ask very quickly uh, what the CDC is actually doing uh, to address the issue of the shortage of healthcare workers in Africa by leveraging doctors, African doctors, in the diaspora uh, using telemedicine um, from a policy perspective, what are you doing to, to expedite uh, adoption um, across Africa? So if Dr. John could just take that, uh, he mentioned leveraging technology. So I just wanted to know what they're doing in terms of pro proliferating telemedicine to support the shortage of healthcare workers inside Africa by leveraging doctors in the diaspora. Um, well, you're, you're referring to me, John, I think, right? John yeah. Sampson. Yes. Okay. Oh, John Sampson is leaving? Uh, uh, oh, yeah, but the question was for John, Dr. John, CDC. Oh, so the CDC. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, uh, if you shoot me an email, I would address that offline. Unfortunately, I really have to run into uh, uh, another meeting. So uh, let's stay in touch uh, by email, and uh, there's a lot I would like to expand on that topic. So. Uh, Mel and Will, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. I look forward to uh, continuing this a very important discussion. We are in a, a, in a marathon. This is just the beginning of a very long race for the continent. We are preparing as best as we can uh, yeah. and, and hoping for the best, but collectively preparing for any worst case scenario that will only be mitigated by effective partnerships across the continent. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, Camille, if I can just um, re respond to your question just briefly, because the program that we that I was discussing is actually a telemedicine, teleeducation program that we're doing with healthcare providers in Sierra Leone. Fantastic. Okay, great. So mm -hmm. I think this is an opportunity for uh, Camille for us to work together. Obviously, we have a uh, a group of like-minded people who want to do something for Africa. Absolutely. So I uh, definitely partnership with you and, and John, uh, John Hopkins and then talking to John Kengasang, we kind of see how we can mobilize this effort. This is all what the meeting is really about. It's about coming together, all of us, to, to do something for Africa. So I really, I'm, re I'm happy that there's some resonance there, <laughs> what you're saying, you know, that we can actually work together to do. Um, even though John has left, I think it would be nice to have one more panel. We'll have a couple of panelists who kind of continue this conversation. Uh, one is uh, Dr. Doc B. Christopher Nyan, a medical doctor and inventor. So he's both an MD, but also uh, working, you know, actually has a company. So uh, Dr. Doc B., can you make some remarks? Uh, 
I think you are muted. You need to take off your your turn on your microphone. Okay, you should be on now. Okay, thank you. Yes. yes. And again, I will start by saying thank you to everyone. Uh, Africa is not short of brains. Uh, out here in the diaspora, just as on the mother continent, you will know that Africans uh, are of exceptional training, skills, and inferior disciplines. And I represent all of them, both on the continent and in the diaspora at this forum. We are innovative, uh, doing research and acquiring knowledge, thus putting us in a position to transfer these skills and technology that are needed on the continent. Uh, throughout this pandemic, as everyone will note, we hear the cries of frontline workers for protective gears, testing kits, and other materials. While testing for COVID-19 and contact tracing are central to mitigating this pandemic, we see that testing kits are in short supply in the world, and particularly on the continent of Africa. Here, on behalf of the diaspora from Shoflex Biomed, we present to you two innovative solutions along with Phantom Alert. Uh, number one, the diaspora has a solution for contact tracing that requires no human contact, but is done electronically, thereby making contact tracing effective and efficient. Now, quite substantially, I hereby also present to you uh, one very innovative diagnostic test uh, Dr. Wei, I don't know if you have the slide up. The, this test is the rapid multiplex diagnostic test for infectious diseases. It is a test that is urgently needed on the continent as a solution in addition to the other tests that we already have. This test detects multiple viruses and bacteria and other pathogens, about three to seven of them simultaneously in 10 to 40 minutes and it distinguishes them. The test is very simple to use. It is, it is very affordable and it is accurate and specific. What I would say is this test has also been patented by the US Trademark and Patent Office has been validated. We conducted three clinical pilot studies at the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. These results were validated and published in Nature Scientific Reports in a Clinical Infectious uh, Disease and International Journal of Clinical Disease. This invention won the African Innovation Award uh, for Social Impact in 2017. This is an invention which detects COVID-19 and many other coronaviruses, including MERS and SARS-1. Given the need for diagnostics on the continent, this invention is available to be produced once the governments and other partners can come together. I would say that Africa has always had solutions. Africa can find her own solutions. This is one of Africa's solutions, this rapid multiplex diagnostic test for infectious diseases invented by an African and is one of Africa's own innovative solutions. We must now commit the necessary financial and material resources from the private sector, from philanthropy and from governments on the African continent in order to have it produced in mass so that we can have the continent serviced. We do intend later to have production on the African continent itself. We want to thank the government of Rwanda and Ethiopia for their interest and their work with us. Thank you very much, Mel, and the constituency for Africa for inviting us. Thank you, uh, Congress Lady Karen Bass, who worked very hard when I testified at the US Congress during the Ebola crisis, and also recommended the establishment of the African CDC which you and uh, Representative Chris Smith worked hard along with others who made those proposal to realize. And there sits one of our own, Dr. John Unkagasson. Thank you very much for being the premier director 
We are all supporting you. And with these innovations coming out of the diaspora and on the continent, we can all work together in order to mitigate the coronavirus disease and other diseases that are threatening the African continent and the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Dogby. Uh, it's really important to kind of see how you can have a medical mind like you making inventions and innovations that can actually really have an impact. And thank you so much for the work you've been doing. I look forward to kind of working together, kind of create a collaborative team, how the diaspora can continue to help address this uh, mimic. Um, before I hand over to Meryl for uh, the last part, I would like to, uh, you know, give a chance for one of our partners as well, which is the Religion and Global Health Forum at Drew University. Uh, you know, religion has been a key part of, it's a key part of Africa, you know, even as people have stopped worshiping, have been sent away from churches um, because of social distancing. That's a really important thing to kind of think about how we can, you know, can, uh, you know, navigate that in global health. So I'm going to give a chance uh, to Dr. Kenneth Ngoa, uh, who is the director of the Religion and Global Health Forum at Drew University. Uh, just a minute for you, Ken, to talk about, you know, what we can do here. Thank you so much, uh, Will, and thanks to all the uh, participants and the panelists uh, for this wonderful opportunity. Um, I just, with the limited time, I just have a couple of points that I want to uh, put on the table for consideration. Uh, Dr. Kengerson talked about social harm when he was describing part of the uh, the work of the CDC on the continent, and he mentioned, uh, he referenced the Ebola, and, and one thing he said that there were a number of people who died um, not not from the Ebola itself, but because of it. And 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 I think one of one of the points that we want to put on the table as part of the discussion around assets, um, global health assets, is the function of religion, which um, not without its own challenges can also be a source of um, mobilization um, for individuals as well as for communities. So we, we definitely do know that uh, it's a powerful force and subject matter in the world. Uh, it does shape communities. It grapples with human questions of human migrations and diaspora and, e and ecological disasters um, and, and all of the rest. And so part of what we do at the Religion and Global Health Forum at Drew is to partner with experts in, in different fields. Um, um, we bring professionals in from the medical field. We bring professionals, researchers, uh, to think about a holistic approach to global health. And part of, part of our thinking here is that um, religion indeed can be a global health asset. And we're drawing on work that's been done since 2002 uh, when researchers met at the Jimmy Carter Center in Atlanta and came up with what they call the religious, um, a global religious health asset initiative. And uh, they, they formed the African Religious Health Assets Program, which lasted for nine years and then was relocated to the University of Cape Town in South Africa and renamed the International Religious Health Asset Program. So how can religion help us think about uh, global health, public health. Um, it, it, there are many ways to do that, but I just name uh, four values that we work on at the Religion and Global Health Forum. One is community building and trust. And we've, we've talked a lot about that. We've heard about that today. Uh, there is the importance of advocacy that, that addresses particularly the experiences of uh, uh, historically marginalized communities and the, the pre-existing social conditions that have made um, uh, COVID so deadly in our own communities. Uh, we talk about research, the importance of interdisciplinary research approaches to global health and ultimately uh, the importance of education. So our simple acronym is CARE, C-A-R-E. So community advocacy, research and education. And, and we can think about the ways in which uh, religious institutions, both in the diaspora and on the continent can collaborate. Uh, with health experts, experts to to create a, a solution to the COVID, but also to plan and develop ideas, platforms, and implementation policies that would help um, Africa and the African diaspora live into a better future of uh, health for everyone. So I'm um, delighted to be have been a part of this, and and we look forward to our future uh, collaboration and participation. Thank you.
Thank you, Kenneth. Um, we've been monitoring, we just want to reassure participants that we've been monitoring the chat round and we've been seeing what uh, the questions you've been posing. Uh, we are going to forward those questions um, and get some responses. So this is just the beginning, like John said and uh, Mel said. So um, and we really want to encourage you to look at ways that we can collaborate um, you know, across the diaspora to support this um, powerful support Africa CDC. So at this point, I would like to hand over to Mr. Melvin Foote, who is the director, I mean, the president of the CFA, uh, to, um, to finish the concluding, concluding part of this uh, session. Mel, are you there? Yeah, thank you, uh, Will. Okay, we're, we're at the end. I apologize for running a half hour over, uh, <laughs> but you know, what else are we gonna do? We're all in quarantine anyway. Um, I always like to have the last few was we really are going to say what's on their mind. And we have three last speakers. They're going to keep it short, but uh, open up your ears and listen to what they have to say. The first one is going to be Dinas Amir. Uh, Dinas is a dynamic uh, young African-American, former football player. Um, you know, was going to go pro to he tore up his leg and then got interested in Africa. Uh, he runs an organization called... Uh, uh, search uh, for Uhuru, and he takes people to Africa. I don't know anybody who's more committed and more passionate about Africa, Africa culture, than Dinas. Recently, Dinas uh, caught the coronavirus and was hospitalized and went through all the trauma associated with it. Uh, you know, and he came back. He survived. He's with us. Uh, very athletic, very physical, and so he's with us. Uh, so I'm going to ask Dinas to speak first. Uh, Dinas, go ahead. The, the floor is yours. Hey, Mr. Foote, thank you so much for, uh, for having me. Can you guys hear me? Okay, I guess, we're, I guess we're good. So everyone, thank you so much for, uh, uh, for having me on here. It, it really means a lot to be on this uh, panel. Uh, yes, my name is Dinas Demir. Uh, I run a, operate a platform called In Search of Uhuru. And basically what we're doing, we're connecting the diaspora uh, back to Africa through uh, art, commerce, and culture. Um, me, myself, I did come down. I, co I contracted the coronavirus uh, a little over a month ago. Uh, it is definitely a humbling um, process. Uh, thank God I take care of myself. And I think uh, me eating properly, working out, uh, is, you know, is the reason why I was able to get through it. Uh, I kind of want to give, you know, there's just a lot of uh, doom and gloom um, you know, out here when it comes to the virus. I mean, of course, you know, protect yourself. Of course, take care of yourself. Uh, of course, take good care of the ne uh, necessary measures uh, so you yourself don't come down with it because I would not wish uh, this uh, disease on anybody after what I experienced. You know, I, I blew my knee out. I played football, ran track for the University of Georgia, uh, blew my knee out. And I tell people um, the, uh, the experience of coronavirus is worse than me blowing my knee out. Um, but you know me i'm just i'm a big believer on you know not living in fear uh not living on pins and needles and 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 getting back to life you know i know i noticed there were a couple of um uh nigerians uh who are on this panel and me personally i i'm getting on a plane as soon as possible as soon as those planes open up and i can catch a delta flight to lagos i'm out you know my home you know like my second home my home is oshun state oshogbo and odoruo so I, I just, I can't wait to get back. But my, my message is, you know, don't live in fear. Uh, don't live on pins and needles. Uh, and, and, and really to just uh, get, back to, get back to life. Because I'm a firm believer, if you're properly taking care of yourself, uh, if you're dieting properly, uh, if you're working out, I mean, you, you could definitely uh, uh, beat this if you were to contract it. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I, I, wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't wish this on anybody. I'm very happy that the diaspora is get very is getting involved in regards to uh, ensuring and making sure that uh, this pandemic does not uh, affect uh, Africa in the same manner that has done Europe and America. Because I, I don't know if you guys have been noticing, uh, a lot of people wish you know they don't understand why is this not hitting Africa, you know, the home of all the pandemics and Ebola and AIDS, you know, all these other stereotypes that um, media puts out. Why is in the Africa in that matter. So, you know, panels like this is important so we can strategize, so we can ensure that, you know, certain parties uh, aren't, aren't privy to getting their wish that, uh, 
you know, again, that this uh, virus impacts Africa the same way that it's doing America and the uh, and, and Europe and China. So, uh, you know, again, I just thank everybody for having me on. Uh, it, it, it means a lot. And, you know, just get back, get out there and uh, take care of yourself, take care of your family and uh, get back to uh, life. That's uh, That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dynast, and I uh, look forward to continue to work with you. Uh, forward. I now want to call up Camille Olawobi, who is the director of the most influential people of Africa descent. He's one of the most active, dynamic uh, individuals on the planet uh, in terms of networking and, and getting uh, Africa uh, So I give him a lot of credit for that. He bugs you sometimes because that's what his job is. Job is to pester you and to get you moving. Uh, so I'm going to call it Camille for your remarks. Thank you. Fantastic. Always good to hear from you, Mr. Foote. Uh, greetings from Lagos, everyone. Uh, my name is Camille Olufobi, and I am privileged to be the CEO of the most influential people of African descent. Uh, I want to thank the organizers for giving the next generation, because uh, mine is a global. Uh, civil society organization for young people of African descent. So we work with the United Nations and the African Union to mobilize the global African diaspora to connect them with their counterparts inside Africa. So when I heard Dinas talk about his experience and you can't wait to get back to Nigeria, um, I, 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 I have to tell you, I'm American, but I haven't gotten on any of the evacuation flights because I feel safer in Africa right now than actually being back in New York. So kudos to the healthcare workers here on the continent um, in terms of keeping the curve, um, uh, you know, uh, flattening the curve. But with that said, there's a worry that the, the, the peak of, the, uh, of, of this situation is gonna hit Africa soon. So I hope based on this conversation and this narrative we're having, we can share learned experience from those in the US uh, with what you've gone through. So by the time this hits us here on the continent, uh, we're able to, to learn from, from your experience. Uh, an interesting point to note is today, I was just talking to our country director in Brazil. Uh, if you know why Brazil is important, that's 100 million people of African descent. And Brazil is scheduled to be the next global epicenter and people of African descent in Brazil too are heavily hit because of access to uh, quality health care uh, for, for African descendants. So the issues that we're facing as people of African descent is global. So it's not just limited to the US, but when you look at South America or you look at Europe, uh, you find that uh, our communities, our people are dying and we need to move very quickly uh, to, to, to leverage our greatest asset, which is what I want to talk about, uh, which is we have a lot of medical professionals in the diaspora. Africa accounts for uh, thousands of doctors, PhDs in the U.S. alone. Um, I, I give a big shout out to a telemedicine platform out there called Moby Health, which is leveraging the diaspora, doctors in the U.K., in the U.S., around the world to support Africa. Uh, and my question to, to John from, uh, Dr. John from CDC was, how are we proliferating, uh, you know, telemedicine on the continent so we can leverage our doctors in the diaspora to support, you know, Africa? Uh, Moby Health is doing an amazing job in that space. And I think we should, uh, you know, work on a policy level on the continent to expedite uh, the proliferation of telemedicine. So. My final thought really is that this platform, this should not be the last. We should continue to do this because we're heavily impacted because of the systemic racism we all experience around the world. So we need to do more of this and broaden our outlook in terms of, um, you know, with Africa. So Mr. Foote, you know, I love you. Thank you so much for what you do. Uh, and thank you to everybody from joining from wherever you are. Stay safe. Thank, Thank you, Camille. Uh, and our final speaker, uh, speaker um, is my best friend, uh, Dr. Julius Garvey. Uh, Dr. Garvey, of course, is the son 
of the great Pan-Africanist uh, Marcus Garvey. He's a cardiovascular surgeon uh, in his uh, career path, uh, obviously a Pan-Africanist. Uh, you know, uh, he believes in the dignity and the potential of African people. And so, uh, I thought it would be best to have the last word to come from uh, Dr. Julius Garvey. Doctor, are you with us? Yes, Mel. Can you hear me? Mel, can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, good. Okay. Um, it, it's been very, very informative for me to um, to have listened to all of the presenters. And first of all, of course, I'd like to um, congratulate uh, you. Um, what else are friends for? And and of course, Will and Janine Scott for putting this uh, together. It's a tremendous idea, and it will have a great benefit as we, we go forward. And it's truly a, a Pan-African uh, concept uh, along the, 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 the lines of the thinking of Marcus Garvey and Kwame Nkrumah. So, so kudos to you, Amel, and uh, those others that I've mentioned. I'd like also to congratulate Dr. Um, Kengasong, the director for the African CDC. I mean, it's been um, an enormous uh, uh, effort that has been uh, put out. The, the, that whole continental uh, coordinated uh, 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 effort at the present time to gather in information and, 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 and to gather um, uh, medicines and, and all the necessities in order to um, uh, confront the, the current uh, uh, epidemic. I think, you know, a number of things uh, have been said, and um, I, I, I'd like to, to summarize a little bit what I think was of extreme importance, you know, apart from Dr. Um, uh, Kengasong's uh, remarks. I, I enjoyed uh, Dr. Demby's remarks in terms of learning from the Ebola uh, crisis, that really we have to um, look at healthcare from the perspective of, of the community. And that includes the community, our, our health workers, and that includes getting uh, the people in the community uh, involved. Because I do remember um, uh, back 2014, et cetera, when some healthcare workers were trying to go into certain communities, they were being rejected because they weren't from the community and they had a white coat on and the people didn't trust them. So um, that's the perspective that we need to have also in terms of the, the, the COVID virus. Um, Gloria brought up some um, some excellent points in terms of what we 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 have been doing and in terms of what we we can do. You know, one of the things that um, um, people aren't mentioning, and that's because of this whole um, reliance, if you will, on on Western um, medicine and and the, the whole concept that you have to take a pill or have an operation in order to be healthy, is the business of the immune system. And, um, you know, I do not know her medication, particularly the LDN, but certainly um, one needs to boost one's immune system. And there are many, many ways to do this. That's one of them. And um, it wasn't mentioned, but recently there's been a medicine out of Madagascar uh, to boost the immune system and to treat the virus, which is based on, on plant medicine, the art, neem and art, artemisin. And of course, um, will uh, has the Phytomedicine Institute there at Harvard, and that needs to, you know, be in place uh, all over Africa because we have a tremendous potential in terms of our, our tropical uh, our plants and different uh, um, our medicinal um, recipes. There are over 30,000 of those uh, in Africa itself, and we need to include our traditional uh, medical people in, in terms of uh, our treatment. Telemedicine has been mentioned, and that's of extreme importance. And um, I, I don't need to elaborate on it more, but um, you know that that's a major, major, major way to bring the diaspora into uh, to help out in terms of uh, healthcare uh, in Africa, in, in order to 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 build uh, capacity and 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 train people. And this is important when you have so many young people that are um, uh, looking for work, et cetera, et cetera, to the extent where they have to uh, uh, migrate. Um, the other thing that was mentioned, of course, is manufacturing. And, and here again, we, we virtually don't manufacture anything in, in Africa. And um, we have to be thinking of importing everything. Well, we, we, you know, we do a certain amount of manufacturing here in the diaspora. And that, that can and will and should be made available in terms of doing the same manufacturing 
uh, on the continent, both in terms of PPE testing kits and so on. I was very, very um, impressed by Dr. Dugbeck in, in terms of his diagnostic uh, uh, test kit. And I'm glad he mentioned that Africa has all of the genius uh, that, that it needs in terms of um, um, being able to um, provide solutions for, for the problems that, that we face. And Dr. Sampson uh, is doing a, an excellent job and what he's doing needs to be expanded. Um, you know, um, um, the, the focus here needs to be not so much what others uh, can, can do for us, but what we can do for ourselves, because we do have tremendous capacity. The thing is that very often we don't know about it, and that's part of the lack of communication. And Mel, again, that's, that's why you need to be congratulated, because you have a great network, and you, you, you can bring us uh, uh, all uh, uh, together. But, um, um, you know, Africa is, is the, the major continent of the future of the world. Um, you know, we, we have basically, um, I would say, 1.5 billion people, 1.2 billion of them in Africa, 300 million or 400 million in the diaspora. We, we need a, a union government that really needs to come together the way the CDC has brought together a continental effort. We need to uh, bring together a, a, a global effort of, of our 1.5 uh, billion people to deal with, with the problems of Africa and to really look to the future in terms of prosperity because, you know, we've been focusing on health, but clearly there's going to be a significant uh, uh, economic price that, that is going to be paid as we go down the road. We have to think about food security because where you import all of your food, then it's a problem when there are no boats coming in, there are no planes coming in, et cetera, et cetera. So the, this is a wake-up call all around, I think, for, for Africans. And you know it's 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 important that certainly as far as the African continent is concerned, it's the richest continent in the world. We have forty percent of the gold reserves, et cetera. You know we are three times the area of China, ten times the area of Europe, and four times the area of the United States. And we have more resources than all of those are combined. so so we 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 have the people, we have the intelligence. We, we, we need the vision, which is the Pan-Africanist vision, which has been generated over 100 years ago, but has not been made manifest. But I, 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 I think that what the CDC has been doing uh, gives me hope. The, the African Free Trade Agreement uh, uh, gives me hope. And I think we all need to join forces, Mel. We need more of these conferences. We need to explain. We need to collaborate more, and we need to bring more of our um, um, uh, not only financial resources but intellectual resources uh, uh, to bear. We need to be that that sixth uh, region and from the diaspora that will help to um, um, build uh, Africa and increase prosperity in the future. And because you know the pandemics will be coming again. Um, uh, and and um, uh, um, economic recessions will be coming again, but we have to plan for them. And I just want to end on, an, on, an, on a note um, that we can take things into our own hand, as, as President uh, Kagame uh, has been saying, uh, uh, Rwanda, why don't we just print our own money? Well, very interestingly, uh, China has decided to come up with, with its own currency. Um, just today, I, I, I read it somewhere. Uh, we can have our own currency. Certainly, we have 40 percent of the world's gold reserves. Why don't we stop our gold and have our own currency? Why do we take other people's paper, which they just print? Like, for example, here in the United States, money is just printed. It's not based on the gold reserve. Anyway, um, you know, we need to take of the future into our own hands in the present and, and deal with the problems that we face so that we really have a future for the next generation. We talk about the youth demographic. But we have to provide systems for them so that they can survive. Uh, thank you again, Melan. It's been a pleasure to participate. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Garvey. Um, as I thought, uh, you really wrapped us up in a, in a good way. Let me say uh, a couple things in closing. One, this is just the beginning. Uh, this is absolutely the beginning. We're already talking about uh, follow-up activities, and I want you all to know that you're part of the follow-up, and we're going to find ways of... Uh, uh, so you'll be hearing about the, the, the follow-up strategy shortly. Uh, let me first of all thank all of the... Uh, 
I want to thank Harvard University, my partner. I want to thank uh, John Inkinger Song for uh, his steadfast support of this effort. Uh, I want to thank all of the speakers. Uh, you all were great uh, and all contributed to uh, a lively discussion. I also want to say that uh, my message uh, is clearly, let's not agonize, let's organize. Uh, I've been consistent with that theme from the, from the beginning of CFA over 30 years ago. And uh, we tend to cry a whole lot. We, we moan and groan, but we don't move. And uh, if ever there was a time for us to move, that time is now. Um, I want to also say that, uh, um, uh, so I, I'm going to leave it there. I'm not going to uh, uh, really uh, expound on it. I thought this was a healthy conversation. And I think we, we clearly got a, a lot of work to do. Uh, it was great to hear from Congresswoman Karen Bass. It was great to hear from my good friend, Dikembe Mutombo, uh, uh, you know, uh, who I think uh, it really does represent. If I've ever thought about what a diaspora looked like, it looks like the Kimbe Matambo, uh, seven feet tall and, and get stuff done. Uh, so I want to really thank uh, him. So, well, I want to really thank you for all of your part. Uh, you and I are connected with him in putting this stuff together. So we clearly are thinking beyond uh, COVID-19 and really thinking in terms of what it's going to take to strengthen the whole Africa, Africa health how do we focus on building a healthcare infrastructure to the diaspora? Uh, we need help over here. We need help here in Washington. Uh, so it just can't be limited to the African continent. It got to be lit. It got to be. It got to be ex uh, inclusive of the African people worldwide. So I just want to leave it here. Thank you all for participating in this conference call, and we look forward to the follow-up. Thank you very much.